Hello, and you're listening to Your Majesty's Secret Podcast. I like my podcast, Shaken, Not Stirred, only on the Four Eyed Radio Network. If you'd like to check out more shows, go to foureyedradio.com. Hey there, Eric here from Socially Awkward Studios, and this 4 Eyed Radio presentation is being proudly brought to you by Raven Designs, illustration and design that fit your personality. For samples and inquiries, visit ravencruise.com. Bond. James Bond. Shaken, not stirred. Utter one more syllable and I'll have you killed. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. For your eyes only, darling. I never joke about my web 007. For England, James? Come in, Univex. James Bond here. Am I going to have a problem with you, Bond? Allow me to introduce myself. You're that secret agent! That English secret agent from England! No, you're cleverer than you look. Mm, still better than looking cleverer than you are. My God, what's Bond doing? I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. 007 reporting for duty. Hello, the name's Berkeley, Ziggy Berkeley, from Cinema on the Rocks. And with me is Eric Dewey, from Socially Awkward Studios. And you are listening to Her Majesty's Secret Podcast, only on the Four-Eyed Radio Network. Brought to you by the wonderful Raven Designs. Raven Cruz designed our logo, and she designed all the logos that we use on the 4 Eyed Radio Network. Check her out on ravencruz.com. Yes, that's right. We are going to be talking about product placement in the James Bond universe today. Might as well get a little bit of product placement on our own side as well while we're, while we're at it, huh? Yes, and if you would like to place some products in your own home, why don't you go to HerMajesty'sPod.com, which is our official website, where you can download every single episode of Her Majesty's Secret Podcast that we've ever done, even the ones that have fallen off the many fine platforms that we release on, including Spreaker, iTunes, Stitcher, and so on. And if you click on the little link that says Amazon, you just shop normally. You don't have to pay a single dime more, but we get a little bit of money that helps us bring you this show for free. So, hey, check us out at HerMajesty'sPod.com and click on the link to (laughs) Amazon.com. And also be prepared for several more plugs for our sponsors during the show, since if we're going to sit here and talk about uh, sponsorship packages and uh, product placement, we're probably going to mention our own a couple of times, but uh, we'll try to keep it to a uh, a dull roar as opposed to a loud shout. But uh, yeah, that's what this episode is all about: is how uh, how do they bring in some extra money to get these movies made beyond the the standard budget? And uh, one of the big ways that movies make money these days is through product placements and sponsorship packages. So exactly, like. Just to start this off with one of the most prominent examples, um, lots of people complained about the TV commercial for Heineken after Skyfall, which actually featured Daniel Craig doing a James Bond type maneuver where he and a case of mistaken identity are running through a train and so on. And people were like, why did they do that? Well, because they paid so much money for that, that it, if you actually took the amount of money that Heineken paid for that ad, it covered a lot of the cost of the movie. And I believe as I Daniel read at one Craig, point that it was about a third of the the total movie budget was covered just by the Heineken deal. Exactly. And so, as Daniel Craig said, you you really couldn't make as high quality a movie if you hadn't gotten that kind of deal which is kind of scary considering the amount of money the movies make. But, you know, Hollywood says that none of them have ever made any money ever. So, you know, but it's so even if we think it's shameless at times, it's what pays the bills. Yeah. And there are there are good examples and there are bad examples. I don't have a problem with the Heineken thing. And like at first, like I remember everybody making a big stink about it. And everybody's like, oh, Bond doesn't drink Heineken. It's like, first of all, this isn't the first movie that he's been involved with Heineken for so there's that and second of all the commercial was a separate commercial in the film yes you do see him drinking a Heineken but you have to know that it's a Heineken to know that it's a Heineken it's not one of the blatant obvious product placements that we see so often especially in TV shows these days 
where it's like literally we're going to actually take a chunk of dialogue from the movie or the TV show and turn this into a commercial for the thing we're plugging. Um, it's never been that blatant. I mean, in some of the in some of the films, it's been near nearly that blatant. But uh, the Heineken was definitely not that. The commercial was a separate thing altogether, and whether you liked it or not, it was not the act- it was not in the movie as far as the uh, <laughs> that goes. Exactly, because if you look in the movie, what he's doing is he's slamming a sweaty beer out of a green bottle right after he has sex on basically a beachfront shack. I mean. Come on, not that's exactly normal a, behavior. Yeah, it's, it's not exactly a martini situation. If you, if you read the situation, you're thinking, what kind of beverage would I want right now? Uh, you know, I'd be going for a bottle of water or a cold beer. Yeah, a cold beer is, ex- I mean, you don't exactly imagine somebody having a nice wine rack in the sort of little shack that he was in or anything like that. And so, yeah, cold beer, sweating out of a green bottle, okay. And like you said, the ad is its own animal. And I actually like the fact that they made it look at least a little bondish because otherwise it would have just seemed just stupid ridiculous. Yeah. Well, at the same time, it wasn't over bondish so that it didn't look like they were trying to overplay their hand. And if you look at some of the ads that they've done in the years since then, they've actually run on a very similar theme just without the Bond characters. So it fits both into their standard ad campaigning, and it really, I don't think, didn't dishonor Bond at all. Plus, we got a better movie because they spent shit tons more money than they really needed to. Right. You know, And, and there are uh, exceptions that prove the rule as well. As we will discuss, there is one particular film in the Bond universe whose entire budget was covered by product placements and did not make it. A better film at all. <laughs> Gosh, I can't might, imagine. It what might that have could even be. made it a worse film. Who knows? We'll, we'll dis- we will discuss that for sure. <laughs> yeah. And so, while we're, do we want to jump right into our bottom 007 product placements? Uh, we could, if you if you want to go with that. So, what we're going to do today is two lists for you. Uh, we've got a list of our bottom 007 product placements. These are the worst seven product placements, in our opinion, um, that have appeared in a Bond film. And this could be uh, for various reasons. And I, I'm sure we both use different criteria as far as determining what a bad product placement was, whether it's just not befitting Bond or whether it was so obnoxious as to break that rule of I'm okay with product placement as long as it's not a commercial in the middle of my movie. Um, or you know, So different criteria may have been used to determine these, uh, these particular ones. And then our other list... I bet Eric was, used math. <laughs> surprisingly, actually, this time I did not. I went more gut feeling on this one. I did have a spreadsheet. I did have uh, a spreadsheet going to help organize myself, but... Uh, no algorithms, no formulas, um, more of a, a gut feeling and more of a how did this strike me when I saw it in the film type of gut reaction as opposed to uh, you know actual mathematical data. Okay, I, as usual, went, it, went, went mainly with gut feeling and a lot of the criteria that I went with were A, does it fit the Bond universe? Does it fit the movie? Does it even matter? Um, in terms of, like, for example, you will not see me mentioning on any of these lists the manufacturers of any of the yachts that we see in the Bond movies. Because you know what? Don't care. <laughs> and I don't think you do either. Because next to nobody watching these movies is going to be saying, oh, James Bond used that yacht. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's a product placement, but it's an ineffectual product placement. It's it's just it adds it adds flavor, but it's just almost irrelevant. So that never crosses my radar at all in terms of whether it's good or whether it's bad. It's just kind of there. I went more with, like I said, does it fit? Can I actually see this belonging in a bomb movie? How is the placement used? Is it too obnoxious? Or what were they thinking? That kind of thing. So. With that said, who would like to start with the bottom 007, you or me? 
Oh, let's. I'll go ahead and give you the honor of uh, firing off that list. So, this is the bottom 007 product placements. Ziggy, number All right. Seven. And, of course, we went with our standard list of the 23 Eon movies and Never Say Never Again. Yes. And my number 007 is a product that James Bond himself would never, ever use. Um, It comes up in a joke inside of a movie, and the joke is on them because the product name that he uses is not at, well, it is now. But back in 1985, it was not actually sold in the United States. (laughs) And that is Whiskas, as in Whiskas cat food, used in A View to a Kill. <laughs> Back in 1985, Whiskas was called Calcan in the United States. Now it's called Whiskas in the U.S., but back then it was called Calcan. <laughs> I so, wonder why they changed it from something that doesn't like immediately make me think of cats in any way, shape, or form to something that immediately makes me think of cats. I wonder why they did that. that. And it was spelled with two K's. Um, in fact, admittedly, my cat at the time ate it. But um, <laughs> it was just like cat food in a Bond movie. Really? I mean, I realistically, it was brought up in the in the form of a joke. But just the fact that we're actually talking cat food in a Bond movie, and we can't even get the name straight for the location where we're talking about, that's why I threw that in at number seven. It was just... It just crossed the silly threshold. All right. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And, uh, yeah, that may be, may be one we talk about later on. Who knows? You know, it's, uh, that's what's great about these short lists off of large uh, pull areas. <clears throat> Our list could be completely different or they could be virtually identical. We just don't know. Uh, yeah, as our regular readers know, I mean, listeners know, um, Eric and I, have not shown each other our lists. We haven't even really discussed them, and we don't even live anywhere near each other. So these are surprises to us as well as you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I, that's one of my favorite parts is actually hearing your list for the first time while we're recording the episode. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I like it. Whiskas from the View to a Kill. For my number seven, I went with one that, well, whereas the, the product itself is not bad and honestly I'm not even sure if um, I I can't even be 100% sure if this was an actual product placement I have to believe it was but I have to wonder what they were thinking because my my impression of this one was that it left me thinking that this was an inferior product like the scene in question kind of makes me think that these are something that are in Bond's way that he needs to destroy in order to get to the to the better stuff, um, and that would be the Volkswagen Beetles in Skyfall specifically. <laughs> you know, it's so blatantly obvious. It's like, okay, that's a that's a bug. There's another bug and another one. Okay, there's a lot of bugs right here. Okay, and now Bond's going to destroy several of them because they just happen to be in his way. And look, they just crumple right up, don't they? Mm, yeah, those look safe, huh? <laughs> Look how quickly those crumple up and fall apart. Um, yeah, if if they paid <laughs> to have those cars used, um, I can't imagine why. It, it's kind of um, it, it's a little scary to me. So for me, um, if it was an actual product placement, I think it was a misused product placement because it left me not wanting that product more than it left me even considering it. And it was very, very noticeable as far as you knew that was a Volkswagen bug. There was no question about it. And so that was that's my number seven is the Volkswagen Beetles in Skyfall. All right. And that, it, it's interesting because a lot of times pe- things that people think are product placements aren't. And I don't know whether the bugs really were or weren't. But, for example, the thing that really jumps out at me, 1987, RoboCop. The Detroit police cars are Ford Tauruses, and they actually had approached the Ford Motor Company, and the Ford Motor Company says, no, we don't want to be associated with this. It's too violent. It doesn't fit our image, blah, blah, blah. So the production company still wanted to use the Taurus, so they actually had to buy Tauruses off the lot, (laughs) and they weren't provided by 
Ford Motor Company. Now, the ironic thing is, of course, for anyone who lived through the late 80s and throughout the entire 90s in the United States, the Ford Taurus suddenly became one of the most popular police cars in the United States. And what started that was RoboCop. (laughs) So sometimes you can have product placement that isn't product placement that works like product placement. (laughs) And How much product placement could a product placement place if a product placement could place product? Chuck Norris. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> you win. Um, so what do you have for your number six, <laughs> sir? Uh, moving on to number six. I had this one. Now, this one, it wasn't as obvious in the film, but it was very, very obvious in the marketing leading up to the film. This was more, um, it was product placement and product tie-in. Um quite dramatically and in your face and we're going to ram this down your throat until you can't freaking stand it anymore. Um, and that was the Revlon tie-in with uh, Buy Another, uh, Die Another Day, sorry. Um, the aforementioned film that got most, if not all, of its uh, actual budget through product placements and product tie-ins, such as the Revlon deal where... There were ads every freaking where telling you, you want to look like Jinx? Buy Revlon. Nobody nobody wants to do that because then they saw the movie and they said, Jinx is a horrible character. Why would I want to look like that? At least that was my, my impression. I was hoping that people would think that. But evidently it seemed to do fairly well for them. So I'm probably wrong in that. But either way, that's my choice. Understandable. I, I thought about that one because I remember the obnoxious ad campaign as well, but since you really couldn't tell in the movie, I left it completely off the list. I consider that one of the ineffectual non sequiturs, but I completely understand why you have it there, and I can't fault you for it. And being one of the people who has never been impressed with Halle Berry, I can totally (laughs) agree with you there. I, I enjoy looking at her. I don't care what makeup she's wearing, honestly. And uh, it was just one of those things that it, it seemed unbond like to me for Bond to be selling makeup. I know it's not the first time they've had makeup tie-ins, and obviously movies are going to have makeup, and especially Bond movies because they have Bond girls are going to have makeup. But it still just it didn't ring true to me. The, the other times that uh, makeup has been used as a tie-in and uh, an advertising tool, it hasn't felt as cheesy and lame. But for that one, it just it really comes off. And that's one of the ones that... Uh, you, there were so many product placements and tie-ins in that film, and that's one of the ones that jumps out at me as just bad. So Well, don't forget, sometimes... It, the makeup can be useful. Just ask James Bond Jr. <laughs> when he had to turn IQ into an old gangster using nothing but the makeup from the ladies' purses. Oh, jeez. <laughs> now that's a Revlon ad right there. Revlon, are you listening? Come on. Get on the James Bond Jr. bandwagon. You want to fight scum. You want to chase scum around the world. <laughs> on to my number six please (laughs) this is one that was actually a deal that was for several movies and using one of james bond's most iconic items the watch specifically i'm thinking of the seiko watch which to me is just too cheap for james bond that that's what it amounts to it's just i know that there are better seiko watches out there but Look at the look at the ones in the movies. They're pretty cheap watches, and I just I don't see James Bond wearing a cheap watch. So that's why I went with Seiko, which was used in several James Bond movies. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I, I I cannot fault your uh, decision making process on that in any way, shape, or form. Um, not even not even a tiny little bit, as we will discuss uh, probably very shortly. It, it's, it's just a cheap digital watch. It's just not really, yeah. So, yeah, my number six, Seiko. Now, my number five falls into the very obnoxious product placement category, 
And that's exactly why it's there. Because even though, and one thing very important to note is that we are only discussing the films, not the books, though there is a little bit of crossover sometimes because Ian Fleming was not afraid to mention brand names at any no. time. Um, and this is a brand name that Ian Fleming, in one of his stories, in fact, when we just discussed in a recent episode, said good things about. Specifically, you can use it to make a bad drink better. However, the way that it was used in GoldenEye was incredibly obnoxious, and I am referring to Perrier Sparkling Water, <laughs> where you have the gigantic water truck that exists specifically to have the word Perrier across the screen in gigantic letters just before it gets smashed. And interestingly enough, the folks from Perrier then paid to have every single Perrier can that fell down from that truck picked up because they did not want anyone collecting one as a souvenir. Are you effing kidding me? <laughs> yes, because when I think movie souvenirs, the first thing I think is, man, I really wish I had a busted up Perrier can. Yeah, so because of just the incredibly obnoxious way. Now, granted, it's tried in true Hollywood, but that doesn't make it any less obnoxious. If anything, it makes it more so. Um, Perrier from GoldenEye is my number five. I am uh, I'm okay with that. I um, we might uh, talk about that in a little bit. As a matter of fact, these uh, <laughs> might be surprised how how much closer these lists are than I thought they would be, considering we had so many to pull from for a shorter list. But um, I guess the ones that really stood out really stood out. So my number five was actually your number six, and that was of course the Seiko watches. Uh, just exactly as you said, it's I understand that they're going to uh, put James Bond in whatever company pays the most for the product placement, but I think there should be some. Not necessarily. I don't want to say quality control because I don't want to speak ill of of Seiko. I've actually had a Seiko watch before, and it worked just fine. I did not feel like James Bond when I was wearing it, but it worked just fine. It was a, it was a perfectly acceptable watch. Um, it's not a it's not a Bond watch. You know the other watches that Bond has has used in the films, um, they're Bond watches. They're going to cost you uh, an arm and a leg for even the lowest end model. And, and they're heavy enough to use as, like, blackjack if you really yeah, need to. Exactly. You can believe that there's gadgets and such built in because they're so heavy-duty and thick and heavy and substantial. Uh, a little plastic POS, you know, just, oh, I need a watch. Uh, oh, here's one for five bucks at the drugstore counter. That's not a Bond watch. If I can, if I can buy it at Walmart, it shouldn't be a Bond watch. That's, that's what it comes down to. <laughs> And if I ever walk into Walmart and see that they're starting to sell Rolexes or Omegas, then I'm going to seriously question the universe. <laughs> you will question their judgment, sir? Yeah, I will. I shall. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I have to completely agree with you on that one. The Seiko, it wasn't obnoxious, obnoxious product placement. It was just, it took you out of the moment because you're looking at it going, why is Bond wearing that? Like, the, the people complaining about Bond drinking Heineken and yet nobody said anything about him wearing a Seiko? Come on now. And yet it does get worse, as we will soon discuss. <laughs> but first, we have the, res the next part on your list. Moving on to my number four. And this is, uh, is going to be a weird one, because this is one where it was a multi-picture deal. And we did discuss, uh, you know, we, we set some ground rules for these lists prior to the episode. We decided that, you know, any one brand can only fill one spot on a list. Um, but I did feel that there were some instances, you know, at least one in particular here, where uh, a brand might end up falling on both lists because of the way it was used. Um, and so this is... I'm Eric, not, always coming up with exceptions. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I don't have any brands appearing on the same list twice, but I will forewarn that there are some brands that, that may pop up on both lists because of different uses in different films. Uh, so for me, my number four, and this one is a bit of a weird one for me because I actually very much like the product. I like the look of the product. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, but I thought they really, really cheapened the product placement because Bond basically didn't use it and then gave it away to the most obnoxious character in the film. 
for seemingly no reason. <laughs> and that would be the BMW Z4 from GoldenEye. Um, it was such a huge deal that, oh, it's now is BMW, not Aston, doing the product placement for the car, for Bond. And then he barely uses the thing and immediately gives it to Jack Wade. It's like, why was it such a big deal that he was driving a BMW? He barely drove the damn thing. So why is it? So I felt that for for a product placement that had so much build up to it, it was almost as if there wasn't enough of it <laughs> when it finally came to the movie. And I was just like, it just it didn't leave me with a good taste. I was like, well, evidently Bond doesn't really like this car very much because you know you don't see Bond just giving away his car to just anybody. And especially the obnoxious, you know, prototypical jerk American guy that uh, that Jack Wade was I- in spades. So, yeah. So the BMW, specifically the Z4 in Goldeneye, makes my bottom list at number four. Now, what's interesting is, and we'll get into this discussion in between lists, but as much as I question the effectiveness of product placement. Um, I, I know it sometimes does work, and that's one instance where I know it works because as as you've heard this story on other episodes, I know someone who bought that car because <laughs> of its association with this movie, and I got to ride it. <laughs> so, it's actually a very nice car, and I, I like the looks of it. It's a great car. I actually like that uh, Z3 even more than the, the versions that followed it, the Z4 and Z5. I think they're on Z6 now, and... I think that Z3 was still the best looking of them, even though it did look like a uh, dressed up Miata. I'm not going to lie, but it still was nice. You know, There's nothing wrong with Miatas either. All right. So you're, you actually took a bite out of golden eye. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> now for my number four used in lots and lots of movies in lots and lots of products, and that is the entire problem. And this is one that crosses beyond James Bond. And that is Sony. <laughs> Specifically, after Sony bought the studio, suddenly every single movie made by that studio has a shit ton of Sony products in it all over the place. Sony cameras, Sony phones, Sony VIO computers. I mean... Don't dislike Sony as a brand. I, I really don't, but just Sony everywhere. <laughs> it just gets to be too damn much. Yeah. And when it's all over all the time and you know exactly why, and it's not just the Bond movies, it's all the movies. Yeah. After Anything. Sony decided to make its studio deal, it just yeah. gets obnoxious. I'm waiting for James Bond to be playing a PS3. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't I wouldn't be uh, surprised at some point. Maybe he's got some downtime. Maybe they hide something. Maybe they're like, here's your super sophisticated computer system that uh, you know links directly to MI6 and with a super secure channel. But we don't want the you know if somebody breaks into your place, we don't want them to know that oh here's the best you know here's a big fancy computer sitting on the desk. No, we're gonna hide it all in a PS3 case. And you're going to yeah. So you, you put the secret <laughs> disc in PS4, PlayStation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then maybe in his downtime, he's sitting there playing the uh, like the previous movies uh, video game tie-in. <laughs> yeah. So my so number four know. for general obnoxiousness all over the place is Sony. And uh, that's. Uh, once again, I, I cannot really question your judgment in any way, shape, or form because I, uh, uh, moving on to uh, to the number three spot on my list, we have Sony Vio specifically. I, I went with one particular instance, and that was because the product placement was not just placed, but it was so blatantly obnoxious. You know, Bond's on a boat with a computer that says Sony Vio in the biggest letters possible across it when. None of yes, computers have their brand names on them because they want. If you're out there using a computer and somebody sees it, they're like, "Oh, that's a nice computer. What brand is it? Oh, okay, I can see what brand it is." They want that out there. None of them say it that big. None of them are proclaiming their brand name and model name in gigantic letters that take up the entire cover of the laptop. 
<laughs> and that one was it was just so blatant and so obnoxiously obvious. It, you know, as I kind of say, you know, anytime something takes me out of the moment of the movie, that's when I really think of it as something that's bad. Um, and that was one of those moments. And it's not, you know, like you said, it's not the only one. And it's it can't even really be blamed for helping fund the movie that much since the studio is the one placing their own product. It's not like they're bringing in extra money to do this. Um, they're just hoping to get that uh, that sweet, sweet, like, oh, I saw Bond use me, uh, Sony Vio. I'm in the market for a laptop. It's got to be a Sony Vio. But you have the model that says Sony Vio, like, in really huge letters across the top. I don't see one of those here. Why is that? When they change the product that drastically to force you to see what it is, that makes it a bad product placement in my mind. And so that's why Sony got on my list as well um, with that very specific example. But I agree. Almost all of them are bad. Yeah. All right. Well, as you know, I can't fault you for that. Now, with my number three, we're, we're treading on almost a sacred cow <clears throat> in terms of it's a very long-standing relationship with the James Bond franchise that goes back pretty much to the beginning. It has occasionally gone on and off, but it it's it was it's it was on again, off again, on again, off again. But every time it it actually jars me out of the moment whenever I see this particular product. And the most per- it especially takes me out of the moment when I saw it in tomorrow ne- no, the world is not enough. I apologize. The world is not enough is where it took me out of the moment the most, but it has been in many Bond movies across many James Bonds. And that would be Smirnoff Vodka at my number three. Oh, I hate American that. vodka. American <laughs> vodka. But it has a Russian sounding t- name. Come on. <laughs> and specifically in world is not enough. Tsiolkovsky, a Russian smuggler, has a warehouse full of Smirnoff. Maybe he just what appreciates the hell? a good value. Smirnoff is is cheap and it's a good mixer. It's it's high enough quality to mix drinks with without uh, you know having weird aftertaste or bad hangovers. But it's cheap enough that you're not going to you know feel bad about making mixed drinks out of it. Why why the hate on Smirnoff, man? It's kind of my go-to American vodka most of the time. Vodka. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm okay when they went with the Finlandia because okay, it, if you just want to say that James Bond is so anti-communist that he can't go for a good Stoli, even though they did for a couple movies, mm-hmm. then okay, fine. At least you're at least you're in the right neighborhood because you know Finland right next door. Okay, cool. But American vodka, I. Okay, call me a vodka snuff, but American vodka. <laughs> no, I don't claim that uh, that Smirnoff is the uh, the the be all end all of uh, vodkas. Like I said, it's just it's. I think it's the. <clears throat> I, I, I think it's the most solid value that you're going to find at almost any store, as far as the quality of the product to the price you're going to pay. I mean, vodka. See, I, is, I I will actually give you a counter to that. And specifically for mixing, if you're looking for something that's a good value, that's clean, um, mixes very well, about the same or even less than Smirnoff, because it goes on sale a lot, Svedka. That works very well. I'll keep my eyes open for it. I, I mean, I don't buy vodka all, all, all the, I don't buy vodka often because I don't. There's not a lot of drinks that I drink that have vodka in it. I'm more of a uh, beer and scotch guy. And beer, scotch, and wine are kind of my go-tos. Um, but when I do buy vodka, it's usually specifically for... Uh, it's almost always for lemon drops. That's kind of my thing. If I'm going to drink a, uh, a vodka-based <laughs> mixed drink or shot, it's probably going to be lemon drops. And I've had really good luck with Smirnoff in, in those. So I'm not going to fault your, your judgment because I do understand... Um, you know, but there are a lot of people, and a lot of people who probably watched those movies and saw it and said, Smirnoff, that sounds Russian. I bet you that's Russian. I'm going to go ahead and get some Smirnoff because Bond likes Smirnoff, or the, the bad guy in this particular movie likes to smuggle Smirnoff from America into America. Uh, or, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> you don't know. It's possible. And for those who wonder, 
it's the Smirnoff distillery was actually started by people who escaped from Russia with a Russian vodka recipe from the Imperial family, but it's still American vodka. So, and nowadays, I mean, it was all glass back in the Connery days. Fine. But now it even comes in plastic bottles, man. Only if you get like the, the three gallon jug. I mean, the regular (laughs) size, the regular fifths are still glass. And you can get them in, like, 50 different flavors, too. So you got that going for you, which is weird. If James Bond ever drinks Fruit Loops vodka, <laughs> I'm going to have to go through the screen. So, mm, I'm just calling that right now. Can you, can you make me a vodka martini with whipped cream flavored vodka? Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> yeah, no. And by the way, when I make my Vespers, I make them with either Stoli or Russian Standard. Okay. Those are the two that I use for that. Um, the Svetka would be for stuff like vodka cranberry, vodka cherry seven up. Vodka cherry seven up is awesome, by the way. Um, well, so that's what's just, great about vodka in general. It's it's got so it's such a mild flavor of its own that it can really be mixed with just about anything. I mean, it's really the only hard liquor I can think of mixing with Kool Aid, and you know, still having a viable drink. I mean, anything else you're going to overpower that flavor. Don't you just wish High C still made Ecto Cooler? Ooh, <laughs> Ecto Cooler and vodka would be really good. Uh, the current bottle of vodka that I have at my house is actually 8 Degree Vodka. Um, that was the one I picked up when I picked up my Vesper supplies so that I could try that. And I haven't killed that bottle off yet, so um, I don't have the bottle in front of me, so I couldn't tell you where it's made. I think you had uh, you had looked it up at one point when I was telling you about it to verify that it was uh, Grain Vodka, which yes. is. Um, but I forget where it's made. I want to say not the United States, but... I think it, if I remember right, it was the Netherlands. I might be wrong, though. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to look it up now because uh, now I want to know. Um, yeah, and that, that's the thing. Every A lot of people think traditionally vodka potatoes, but um, a lot of vodka is grain vodka, and that's specifically what James Bond calls for when he discusses the recipe for the Vesper. That's why it's... That's why we're looking for the grain vodkas for these. Just going off on a liquor tangent. And by the way, sometime in the next year, not anytime really soon, but just something to look forward to in the next year, we will be having a booze-themed episode. Look forward to that. (laughs) This is going to be the best episode ever, except you're not going to be able to understand anything we're saying. Um, (laughs) No, but I I did just uh, verify it. Actually, the 8-degree vodka, which was very good, and I've used it in a couple of other other things. It was very clean, very good vodka, um, and it's a product of Holland. Ooh, the Netherlands. So, there you go. (laughs) So, moving on from number three, American vodka. Um, My number two, this is from... The other movie in the Bond series that a lot of people slam for so much product placement. Because you have Buy Another Day. I'll go with Eric's title for that movie, really. Um, And then before that, one that had a ton of product placement, which I really didn't mind for the most part. And the reason I didn't mind it for the most part is because either it worked well or the movie was so silly anyway I didn't care. And that would be from Moonraker. The one thing that did rankle on me, though, and I admit there there is part of, partially a personal prejudice that makes it go this high on my list, and that's Marlboro. Because, <laughs> <laughs> one, I found that particular placement just looked really, really obnoxious. And, yes, I have a personal disgust for smoking, but it's just – I don't associate James Bond with the idea of Marlboro, which I think of as <laughs> a con- – common American cigarette. Mm. If James Bond is going to smoke, then I know he's got his custom-made cigarettes that he gets done specifically by one tobacconist, and otherwise, if he's going to go for cigars, it's going to be some really nice Cohiba or something like that. A common American cigarette just, it's like the Seiko watch. It's just, no, no, just no. It, it doesn't fit the James <laughs> Bond image at all. And the placement was really obnoxious in the movie. Yes. But it's basically for the, the combination of the obnoxiousness and the utter commonality that just I don't buy it as Bondy necessity. Marlboro from Moonraker, my number two for bottom 007 product placements. All right. Um, 
I cannot fault your judgment in any way, shape, or form. Um, even as a an ex smoker myself, I, I also uh, dislike the the prevalence still, even these days, of uh, smoking in films and media in general. Because it's still, I mean, <laughs> I haven't had a puff in twelve years, and I still will have a craving every now and then, especially when I see somebody else smoking, and especially if it's in something in, in a story that I'm getting into. You know, if I'm if I'm watching a movie or reading a book or watching a TV show and somebody lights up and you know I'm I'm feeling that movie, I, that craving comes and I'm just like, what the heck? I'm like, seriously, it's been 12 years. Why am I still craving this crap? Um, so surprisingly enough, in such a short list with such a long pull from, we have an identical spot, and it's high <laughs> on the list. Um, I also disliked the Marlboro. Uh, product placement in Moonraker, specifically because, first of all, we were already at the tail end. Like we discussed, in the early films, and especially in the early books, Bond smoked all the time. And so did everybody else. Because that's, I mean, that was kind of a sign of the times. Everybody smoked. But by the time we got to Moonraker, we were kind of at the tail end of that. And, you know, people were starting to catch on that, hey, this is actually is not really good for you. And maybe we shouldn't be promoting this as much. Maybe we should, uh, you know, start to, to, to maybe take a step back. You know, we're at, we're at a 10 on the smoking right now. We need to bring that down to a 7 or a 6, you know. Um, so it seemed like it was forced in, and it seemed, you know, it was, a, it was a bad idea, I think, to even accept that placement at that time. And then, like you said, on top of all of that... You essentially have the the Coors Light of cigarettes. Uh, you know, it's like like I have no problem with Bond drinking a Heineken. If he'd have cracked a Bud Light, I might have actually had a problem. And that's what this felt like to me. Is you know, it just doesn't fit the character. Um, so, yeah, my number two as well, Marlboro. All right. So, who wants to do number one first? That sounded pretty bad, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. Um, all right. Well, my number one um, also just – it just feels out of place. And I'm not knocking this brand at all because I, I love this brand. I uh, purchase this brand fairly often. I, I wouldn't say like all the time, all the time. But I'd say once a month at least I probably purchase this brand. Um it's it's not a bad brand. I enjoy it. It's good. It does not make me think of Bond. And when I think of it being in a Bond film, it always just kind of grates on me. And even though it's not even the most obnoxious of placements, it's a background piece. You, you see, here's Bond walking, and in the background is Kentucky Fried Chicken. That does not... Just, it just doesn't sell Bond to me. I love KFC. They get a great, great tasting food. Um, even if the 11 herbs and spices are just salt and pepper, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me at well, all. Of course, because <laughs> you love chicken. I do love chicken, but I did not love the product placement of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And even though, like I said, it may be somewhat irrational because it wasn't even an obnoxious placement. You didn't see Bond walking around with a giant bucket of chicken, like digging in, like, mmm, this is good. No, it's just, you know, hey, look, there's a KFC behind him as he's walking away from his car. But even that was just like, no, I don't care that he's supposed to be in the U.S. I don't care that he's supposed, you know, I don't, no, no. It didn't work for me, and it t takes me out of that moment every single time when I see that KFC because I start thinking about the KFC instead of the movie. And, and which movie out. was that? Uh, it was Living the Die, was it not? No. I'm, I, it just boggles See, me. you're saying it takes you out of the moment, and you can't even remember the That's movie. how far out of the moment it takes me. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's just. I'll 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 let you go with it. I'll just say I question your judgment, sir. And we'll talk about it later. <laughs> oh no, I yeah, it's just one of those ones. That just doesn't it doesn't feel Bond enough to me. And uh, even though it's a product I like, it's not. I just I can't I can't I can't abide. You're not the dude about it. I'm not. So what is your number one, sir? School I can't movies. believe you missed this one, especially after a comment you made talking about Marlboro. Uh-oh. The single most are you effing kidding me. <laughs> and this was in an are you kidding me moment in the movie. He doesn't actually end up 
being there long enough to make use of the product, but the fact that it's even ordered for him is obnoxious. From License to Kill, when he is in the titty bar in Florida, <laughs> Budweiser. <laughs> oh, I... What the hell is James Bond doing with a Bud product? Yeah, I I think I've kind of blocked that. I think I kind of purged that one from my memory. Um, because I, I didn't. The, if I'd have remembered that one, it definitely would have been on this list. <laughs> the, the cheapest mass market beer in the U.S. and the world. Why, Bond? Why? <laughs> I mean, he could he could even jumped up in class by ordering a Miller Lite, <laughs> Schlitz malt liquor. Hey, don't knock the Schlitz. <laughs> well, the Schlitz brown bottle is actually really good, but the Schlitz malt liquor. Yeah, I mean, well, come on, liquor. you you so, got to be hurting yeah. for the Schlitz malt liquor, my, and you uh, will be hurting afterward. <laughs> my my grandfather used to work for for Schlitz, and uh, still at my grandma's house, they've got a lot of. Uh, various Schlitz paraphernalia around the house. There's even uh, um, on my, my uncle's bedroom door, he's got a plate that says, notice, we are not out of Schlitz, the management. Um, <laughs> they've got several Schlitz coasters. Um, there's a, there's another, one of the coasters says, when you're out of Schlitz, you're out of beer. Um, so, <laughs> it's, I, don't, I don't hate on the Schlitz. The Bud, yes. And if I'd have remembered that, it would have made this list, but I kind of blocked it from my memory i guess yeah just james we're not talking james bud okay we're just <laughs> not it's just wrong maybe james so, bond yes. jr sneaking some beer into the school you know maybe that's all he could get a hold of with some bud oh come on that's the best he, I can he do. can that's do better than that I mean, it's the early 90s he can get red dog <laughs> <laughs> get some boone's farm up in there but no so, yeah, my bottom 007 worst product placement, Bud, in License to Kill, because wrong. Just wrong. <laughs> now, with that right. said, I'll digress for you. I'll give you a little bit of a historical note. Um, I happen to be up on a little bit of alcohol history, go figure. And Captain Frederick Pabst, of course, of the Pabst Brewing Company, Back in the day when it wasn't considered retro because, hey, it was the actual, it was back in the day, so there's nothing to go retro to. And he would regularly host parties in his mansion, and brewery magnets were all invited over, of course. So you had, you know, Miller, and you had the Eline family from Schlitz, and they would come over and invite them over for a dinner party. And he'd ask, so what would you like to drink, gentlemen? And... Being that this was Captain Pap's mansion, they would, of course, figure they're expected to say Pabst. And so they all say Pabst, except for Eline, who says Schlitz. Captain Pabst reaches down and grabs a Schlitz for him. <laughs> Very classy. I like that. <laughs> so just a little bit of history for you, folks. But when it comes... Very cool. Now, as we're in between our lists, when it comes to product placement... Does it ever do anything good for you? I mean, do you ever buy into product placement? Have, have you ever gotten something because of its association? I mean, how does advertising work on you at all? I can't say that I've ever actually, like, immediately gotten up and, like, left the movie theater or finished watching a TV show and said, oh, I need to go buy this right now. Um, I don't think it's ever consciously affected me directly. However, I can... Uh, think of examples when I happen to have been in a store and see something on a shelf and think, oh, hey, I saw this in this. I may not buy that product right then, but the association is there. And that's all. That's really what advertising is all about, is forming that association so that when you are ready to buy something, you've already got that brand, that particular product in your mind. Um, it's not necessarily about the direct, oh, I'm gonna, I, saw the, I saw Bond drinking a Heineken. I'm going to go buy Heineken right now. It's more of a, I'm in the beer aisle, I'm looking at the beers. Oh, hey, Heineken, I remember seeing that in the last Bond movie. And maybe I pick it up, maybe I don't, but I thought about it. Whereas before, I might have just glazed right over it and you know looked at uh, Sam Adams or something else. So 
I can't think of any times when I specifically bought something because it was in a movie, with the exception of, um, you know, when we've done stuff for the show, like with the Vespers. I specifically went out and got Gordon's gin because that's what was called for in the recipe for Vespers. Um, you know, so there there are those type of things, but that was only because it was very specifically to match that recipe, not just a oh hey I'm doing this because I saw it in the movie. All right, for me, <coughs> I I have I don't really jump at product placement advertising. I mean, just because I see a ton of Coke. The beverage, by the way, like the Cherry Coke Zero in front of me. <laughs> if I if I see someone's drinking a Coke or Pepsi in a movie, that's not going to change my opinion of whether I'm going to drink Coke or Pepsi. I'm going to drink whichever one I was going to drink anyway. Right. For me, I find the main thing that, in fact, really the only thing that consciously affects me in terms of advertising is when it's advertising for a item or something that's coming out for a specific moment in time. Like, for example, a trailer for a movie. Mm -hmm. That movie is about to come out in a theater, and it's only going to be there for a, for a short amount of time, a few weeks. So it's like, okay, this movie is coming on this date. Now I know when to go see it. Right. Or this baseball team is coming to town on this particular date. So now I'm informed I can go see that game if right. I want to or something like that. So same something that's very temporal for, in nature. Yeah. The same thing could go for like specials. Like when an advertisement comes on for a particular store or brand or something like that, that they're having a sale from this day to this day and it's something you already wanted and were thinking about buying and they're like, oh, well, I, if I buy it during these days, I can get a special on it. That's a you know, similar type of uh, you know, time-specific advertisement that, that actually does work. And it doesn't matter if I enjoy an ad that that will not that will not make me buy a product. Like for the longest time, right up until about 2011, 2010, I would say, for a stretch of years, Budweiser and specifically Bud Light had the best advertising on earth. Their commercials were hilarious. Their radio ads for Real Men of Genius were some of the funniest ones I've ever heard on the radio. And if anyone ever wants to have some fun, go on YouTube, look up Bud Swear Jar. Commercial's really, really funny. <laughs> but as you probably noticed from my recent bottom 007 <laughs> list, I won't drink that shit. I, I don't like Bud. I think it's cheap swill. It is. And the only reason I would drink it is if I was at a party and that's all they had. And then I would think very badly of the host. <laughs> so it's not going just be, I love the commercials, but they've wasted their millions on me. Yeah. And I also don't think that anybody has ever decided, you know, I'm going to get a visa card just because Morgan Freeman has sponsored, had told you about it during the Olympics or a baseball game or whatever. I mean, I, I consider that just wasted millions. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really um, weird. You got to wonder. Obviously, there's got to be research somewhere that's saying that it's working on some level. Well, that's because the they funny wouldn't thing. Wouldn't spend the money, right? I when I took an advanced statistics course, um, yes, I really did. Um, and of course, advanced stats in the modern age is all about things like marketing and for marketing professionals and so on. And the studies actually are completely inconclusive and in some cases show that advertising either you don't know if it works or except in cases that you can definitely measure for temporal items may not work at all. And one thing that a lot of marketing people worry about is that somebody's going to figure out, figure this out because this, the same people <laughs> who are doing these studies also make the money off the advertising. And so it's, it's one of those tenuous things where, our entire system that allows for broadcasting in the Western world is based on sponsorship mm -hmm. and or as the Star Trek Next Generation scripts called it, the Ferengi communication technique. <laughs> <laughs> and is it really that effective? You can't really be sure. They're, they're, it's amazing how little they have to back it up and yet 
that's all they got to go on, and they assume that it works. And I'm sure in many cases it does. But I think the important the thing to is, note is a lot of the, the research, and, and most of what I've seen, and granted I haven't taken any advanced classes in this, but most of the, the articles that I've seen on this type of thing tend to rely very heavily on asking people, did you ever, you know, how many products have you bought directly because of advertising? And I think it's something people do have the, uh, the, the, the basic nature is to deny it, even if they aren't doing it consciously. It may be something they don't want to admit that that commercial worked on them, that that commercial made them buy a product. So a lot more people, I think, are going to say, no, no, advertising doesn't work on me at all. Whereas maybe on a subconscious level it is, and maybe even on a conscious level that they just don't want to admit it is. Or on the other hand, you also have, and this is what makes personal interviews really unreliable as a research source, and this even goes on to police work and so on, is you'll have somebody ask a question, and for a lot of people, the automatic response is to try and please the person asking the question. Yep. In which case, they will say yes, even though they would never touch it in a million years. <laughs> this is why <clears throat> some folk, like you can have some TV shows that they will show to focus groups and so on, say, so would you watch this? And people say, yeah, and then the damn thing bombs. Because <laughs> they'll say, yeah, for a moment, and the, then the show will come on and say, oh, I don't really want to watch this. Now, the one thing I will say as far as advertising for me as well is, while it's iffy whether it will make me get something, a stupid ad will make me not want to get <laughs> something. Because if you are, and so many pieces of advertising are built this way nowadays where the person who your character in your commercial is a complete idiot. Yep. It's like, so you're telling me that if I want to be a complete idiot like this guy, I will buy black and Decker tools. Well, guess what? Toyota I don't guy, want to be a We're looking idiot. at you, Toyota guy. Oh, well, Jan's kind of hot, but that said, I, I drive a Nissan. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, who's that? What's his name? Ted? Or, I, I forget what the character's name is. But he's like this bumbling buffoon moron who everything in his life revolves around Toyota, and I just want to punch him in the throat. And I never want to buy a Toyota, even though I know Toyotas are good cars. I have, I have, I have no hate for the brand itself, but those commercials, man. Oh, I want to just know this guy's a moron. And everything in his life revolves around Toyota. And I'm like, if I buy a Toyota, am I going to turn into a moron like this where my life revolves around what kind of car I'm test driving this week? No, I don't want that. Yeah, so advertising is an interesting, nebulous thing. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of times also, I'm like, some of my favorite commercials, I couldn't tell you what they were for. I was like, I saw this commercial. It was hilarious. I had this guy do this. I had this girl doing this. Like, well, what was it for? I, I don't know. They said at the end I wasn't paying attention at that point. Um, so was that an effective commercial? I would say no, because I don't even know what brand it was talking about at the end of it. But, uh, hey, at least it entertained me during the time. And now we've entered a world because of the internet and because of uh, you know DVR and type things. People are able to skip, especially on TV. People are able to skip through the actual commercials or avoid them altogether. So we've gotten this new level of product placement, where instead of just showing a thing in the show, there's actually time devoted in the script to talk about the features of the thing. Or well, that's everything old is new again. That's how the old radio plays worked. <laughs> in fact, there, and if you um, watch the 1995 movie of The Shadow, which I think I'm one of only 12 people who liked that movie, um, there's a scene in it where you have Lamont Cranston talking to the villain, and some of the villain says, nice suit, where'd you get that? Oh, Brooks, for Brooks Brothers, Fifth and Madison. And it, that <laughs> it's exactly how they would do it in the radio plays. And by the way, for anyone who would like to try, who, who dissed that movie before, think of the whole movie as a radio play. It plays a lot better. It's actually pretty cool. <laughs> but <clears throat> returning to the universe of James Bond. Yes. Though I, I, th I think that it's, it's really important to have an idea of, you know, just where product placement sits in things because mm -hmm. it is so prevalent. That's why we're doing the episode. Yeah, and I don't. And now we're even with uh, as I was talking about the TV shows and how they how they do that now, where it's almost a commercial within the show. I don't honestly mind that much because I understand that 
it's my style of TV watching that's caused this. So I, I apologize to all of you who still watch TV with commercials and get the product placement commercial in the uh, TV show as well. But you know, people like me who watch on DVR or Hulu or Netflix or you know any of these other services where I'm not getting served fresh ads and they need to do the product placement to get that get that revenue in. I don't mind it so much when it's not forced in to an actual plot point. What I don't like is when they actually force it in to where, oh, the feature of this particular car is actually what allowed us to solve the case on CSI or whatever. I'm like, no. The you know automatic lift gate that you can put your foot under the bumper and lift the gate is not how you solve this case. That's not, no, that is not a thing that just happened in my world right now. <laughs> so those I mind, the just the general... Oh, everybody's getting in a car to go someplace, and they take them, oh, this car's really nice. Oh, yeah, it's got a lot of great features, too. Check out my Bluetooth stereo. Okay, now we're here. End of end of deal. I can live with that. It's the forcing its way into the actual plot of the story that I disagree with. All right. Now, what we're moving on to now are the top 20 product placements in James Bond movies that we did not disagree with. <laughs> so the opposite of our previous list. And since I started the last list, why don't you go ahead with your number 20 of your top 20 product placements? Again, brought to you by Raven Designs. <laughs> and Amazon.com visits. Visit HerMajesty'sPod.com and click on that Amazon banner and uh, you know, help us out. Help us out just a little bit. My number 20 is, it only is this far down on my list uh, because the company itself, as it was advertised or as it was placed, uh, doesn't exist anymore. So I felt it couldn't really make it too far, too high on my list, but I liked it because it wasn't too blatant, yet it was very obvious and it made you think about that brand. And that is uh, Pan Am. Right from the very beginning, you know, we saw Pan Am in Doctor No. Um, I believe it was in other uh, movies as well. And Moonraker. Yeah, there you go. And uh, yeah, I thought it was a good product placement. It wasn't too blatant. It wasn't too in your face, but yet you knew that Pan Am existed in there. But because it doesn't anymore, it doesn't get higher than number twenty on my list. But that's my number twenty. <clears throat> American Airlines. I admit Pan Am did not make my list, and the, I thought about it, but the reason it didn't is it was so ubiquitous. I mean, it was the airline. And now, it, of course, nowadays you get to the point where unless there's specific deals in place, you have fake airlines that are used a lot of times <laughs> in movies. Um, like, instead of TWA, there's like TVA or something like that, or I don't remember exactly, but very, very close, and so I, I understand where you're coming from. It just, it's it became so common that it just kind of flies past my radar now, so to speak. But I'm bummed. <laughs> but I understand what you're saying. Now, with that said, my number twenty is also very common, and that's why it appears at number twenty, and it's a staple of this particular setting. But that's also why it had to be here, and that is. From Dr. No, Red Stripe Beer. Nothing says you're in Jamaica, Mon, like Red Stripe <laughs> Beer. And nothing says you're in a bar in Jamaica, Mon, like a room full of cases and cases of Red Stripe Beer. Well, I'll and, be empty, but we won't discuss that. I guess they just drank it all, right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and so... It, it establishes a setting. It's a very common feature. Just about anything you see associated with Jamaica, or in depending on if you're in the middle of the 1990s, a Jamaica drug posse, you <laughs> will see a red stripe beer show up sometime. And so, yeah, it's common. It's there. And yet, it it makes sense. And it kind of made me smile to see it. So my number 20 from Dr. Doe is red stripe beer. Welcome to Jamaica, Mom. Have a nice day. <laughs> Um, I will say that I slightly question your judgment, sir. Not dramatically. Um, we've got so many things to choose from, but uh, I'm kind of surprised it's that low. But It's uh, that low specifically because it is so common. All right. Because so many movies do it. 
that's one of those things like, okay, we need to make sure the audience knows that this is Jamaica. So we're going to need uh, dark skinned people saying Mon, and we're going to need Red Stripe. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what the setting is. We can have a, a background that doesn't look anything like Jamaica. If we have people saying Mon and Red Stripe, people will associate it with Jamaica. Yes. Mon. So. So I, I I can understand my judgment being questioned. I'll I'll look Just forward slightly. to when Just when the question comes up. <laughs> but moving to number nineteen, mm-hmm. this kind of skated one of my rules in terms of when you look at the product on the screen, you have no idea who made it. This is specifically for the people, which is I think most diehard Bond fans, who stay through the entire end credits and read them. <laughs> And yet, I would have no awareness of this brand existing ever if it weren't for James Bond movies and sitting through the credits. Now, that said, is this ever going to make me make a purchase involving this brand? No. However, I would not know that Brioni tuxedos and fine dinner jackets and menswear (laughs) would exist without the many placements in James Bond movies, particularly of Pierce Brosnan era. I would have no idea. I mean, because if it was if it was just Giorgio Armani, everybody knows freaking Giorgio Armani. Everyone knows Gianni Versace. Brioni, I would never have heard of. Now, maybe that makes me some kind of a pleb. Um, <laughs> but, so... If it's any consolation to you, not only did I not know that name, um, I also can honestly say at no point during any of the movies, I am such an uncultured swine that I didn't even wonder... Who made the tuxes? I just, man, it's a tux. Tux is a tux, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that, that's, so that's my number 19. Brioni, fine menswear right. from many James Bond movies. That's one of those things that, um, because it's so specific, it's one of those things like if I ever won the lottery, I would probably seek that out and get a suit or a tuxedo from them just to say, hey, look, I got this tuxedo from the same company that made Bond's tuxedos in X number of films. Um, so that is a product placement that could work only in the very specific scenario that an uncultured swine such as myself suddenly stumbled into a boatload of money. So in that particular exact situation, great product placement, guys. Great product placement. I, I, I agree with you there. I, I think that could happen on my end as well. But generally, no. When I need a tux, it will be what... What tux happens to fit me that I can afford? Exactly. And I understand that tuxes are going to be fitted by a tailor. I'm not that much of a pleb, but still. So what do you have at number 19, sir? (laughs) My number 19 is another brand. I wanted to put this higher, but I couldn't bring myself because the, the brand as it existed in both the movie and in the book where it was originally brought up doesn't exist in the same form that it was placed in. So this I know wasn't what you're picking. <laughs> so I can't say And I question was. your judgment, sir. Oh, jeez, <laughs> wow. Um, well, I will tell you that another uh, piece of this may have made it higher on the list since it is something that's available. But because this particular item, as stated, is no longer available as stated, um, I have to say that the product placement itself isn't as effective. And granted, it probably wasn't an actual product placement. It probably wasn't a paid placement. Um, it was more of a fact of, hey, we're going to exactly quote the book from which this line came. And at the time the book was written, this existed in this form. But at the time the movie was made, it did not. And, of course, that is the Kinalele from the Vesper recipe in uh, Casino Royale. Uh, very unique. And, uh, you know, it definitely, I mean, that's a product placement that worked. Like I said, I went out and bought ingredients to make Vespers. Not, not just because I saw it in a Bond movie, but because, you know, we wanted to talk about it and I wanted to try it. But uh, had they not specified what it was, I wouldn't have specifically sought out the, the Lille Blanc, which is the, the current available version of it. Um, but only because it's not available in that form anymore, it makes it that low on my list. But it's still very, very strong product placement um, because it is one of the few things that I actually purchased because it was in a Bond movie. So that's my number 19. Kina Lele. All right. I question your judgment, sir. 
What do you have at number 18? <laughs> My number 18, and this is just one that, uh, again, you might have to, I think you might have to stay through the credits to know the name of this exactly, but it was just such a cool scene, and it's one of those ones that if I was ever going to be in this area, and it was open and it was available to me, I would definitely go there, and I would probably only go there because I saw this in a Bond film, even though it was not one of my favorite Bond films, and that would be the, I'm probably mispronouncing this horribly, the Schlitzhorn Peas Gloria Revolving Restaurant. I would visit the heck out of that place. <laughs> And probably only because I saw it in the Bond film. I don't think I would necessarily, if I just was in the area and somebody said, oh, they've got this revolving restaurant over there, eh, whatever. But I'd be like, oh, wait, the revolving restaurant from the Bond movie? I'm there. So I think it's kind of effective in that scenario. Again, we're talking about uh, you know very specific instances where my own uncultured self suddenly has the money to go visiting these places. Fair enough. Just watch out for the artwork. It might hurt you. <laughs> I I thought about it, but that did not make my list. Um, something kind of similar did, though. Ironically, of the two of the place that I is actually on my list, and Piz Gloria, Piz Gloria is probably the one I would be more likely to want to visit. <laughs> <laughs> so go figure. But all right, now for my number eighteen, again, this kind of bends one of my rules a bit because. You have no idea who made it. it. It doesn't really show up in terms of the brand name. In fact, even as we were compiling our list of source material to go from, a lot of the a lot of play, a lot of passes don't mention the manufacturer or they get it wrong. But the thing with this particular item and what made it effective is it announced the I the class of item to the general public. It was something that really wasn't very popular beforehand, and then this is just as it was coming onto the common market for people to you know, check out and use and so on, and that would be from The Spy Who Loved Me, a Spirit Marine wet bike jet ski. Because <laughs> who heard of jet skis before that? They really weren't a thing. But this was the announcement of, here comes the jet ski. It'll be something cool. You'll be getting these in a few years. And so, and even though we don't commonly all have them, of course, we all know what they are. And so, just for that announcement of this kind of product is coming real fast, mm -hmm. it, it's very effective. It, it piques people's interest so that when they actually see it later on, it's like, hey, I, I know what that is. So, as an announcement of something to the world, I went with the Spirit Marine Wet Bike Jet Ski. From the Spy Who Loved Me at number eighteen. All right, I can honestly say that one did not make my list. Um, I don't don't question your judgment. I think your uh, reasoning is sound, so I'm not going to give you any garbage for that one. I like it. All right, now number seventeen. I had to put it on the list somewhere because the one the the stylistic association with James Bond is a no brainer. And then also the historical association with James Bond as written by Ian Fleming to the point where this played host to some of Ian Fleming's written works. So, yes, some people actually do read it for the words and not the pictures. That would be Playboy magazine <laughs> as seen in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And there was also a visit to a Playboy club in a later film. Mm -hmm. And yes, you do also see, very quickly, George Lazenby looking at the Playboy mo magazine sideways. <laughs> <laughs> he's giving it a good good look, making sure that he's seeing exactly what he thinks he's seeing. Um, I do not fault your judgment on that. Um, we'll just say we'll, we'll talk about it again probably in the near future. Because uh, Playboy, Bond, it's just oh, yeah. a no-brainer. <laughs> definitely, definitely agree with you there. So what do you have at number 17, sir? My number 17. <laughs> You're going to hate this. I'm going to be I'm going to be honest with you. Um, not only because this is from a movie that we've discussed was horrible for product placements, but also from a brand we've already discussed was extremely horrible for product placements, but I loved this particular one in this particular scene. And it really, uh, it stood out to me as something really cool and exciting and fun. 
and didn't come across as blaringly uh, product placement-y as most of their other placements. And that is specifically Sony Ericsson, specifically the cellular phone used to remote control the BMW in Die Another Day. I, you just like it because it has Eric in the name. <laughs> I'm sorry, and Tomorrow Never Dies, not Die Another Day. I'm backwards again. But there's so many dies, too, too many dying. Um, <laughs> but the remote control car, uh, so fun. Such a fun scene, too. Even in a movie that, uh, you know, arguably it wasn't the worst when it comes to product placements, but they were already heading down that path. And obviously, we, as we discussed, most Sony products are blaring in there. But uh, Sony Ericsson's not a big cell phone name in the States, and it especially wasn't then. It's a little bit bigger now that uh, AT&T has started carrying a lot more of their, their phones. So you see a lot more Sony Ericsson phones than you did previously. But at the time, it was just such a fun scene, such a cool thing. And at, you know, at that time, smartphones weren't a common thing. And if you had a smartphone, you had BlackBerry. That was it. That was the only option for a smartphone. You didn't have touchscreen, flip open, full keyboard, you know. Uh, it's kind of like the, the Nokia placement in uh, Saint. Um, it was just, that's a cool idea. Oh, my gosh, that phone flips open and there's a keyboard in there. And then, you know, little did we know that just a few short years later, not only would that be commonplace, but it would be much smaller and more sleek looking than anything they put in the movie. But, uh, yeah, so... Even though I dislike most of Sony's product placements, I'm going to go with the Sony Ericsson at number 17 for that particular scene. I'm not going to hate on it, but I'm just going to look at you with mild disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand. Fair enough. So then what do you have at number 16, sir? At number 16 is another one that may surprise you. Uh, probably not in a bad way, though. Um, it may surprise you simply because I included anything from this movie on a list, which I very, very rarely do. Um, and Ooh, I, I did know that. where it's from. <laughs> so Yeah, you already know what movie it's from. Um, and this is just because it, it's, it's fun. It really lends itself. I mean, in that particular context, you know, one of the best scenes in this movie, and, uh, you know, for those following along at home, if you don't know already, it's Never Say Never Again, a movie that I often... Uh, dismiss, you know, yes, they're included in my list. Yes, I always look at the things. Things from this movie very rarely make it onto my list. But in this case, I thought the inclusion of the video game, specifically Centipede, a game I love to play, um, and just right there, just right smack dab in between Sean Connery and uh, Kim Basinger, just boom, hey, look, Centipede, I love that game. This is awesome. So the Centipede placement in Never Say Never Again makes my number 16. All right. I applaud you for actually acknowledging the movie's existence, <laughs> and we'll be talking about that later. Oh, all right. All right. Now, my number 16 kind of surprised me, but th th there's some logic here. Really, there is. Uh -huh. um, and that would be from The Spy Who Loved Me, Bacardi. And the reason that I say that is you have... Bond mentioning by name an alcohol that you do not associate with Bond at all, and he's specifically saying he's ordering it as the drink for Agent Triple X. And that, of course, is supposed to be her signature drink, at, um, her version of the vodka martini. And I just thought that because you have that scene where you're tr where he's showing the contrast between the two, where she mentions his drink and then he's supposed to come up with her drink. It sticks out in your head. And even when it had been a long time since I'd seen that movie, um, it, it just, I remembered exactly what drink she had because that scene, just because of the contrast, stuck out. So it, I have to say, it was really effective product placement. Now, does that mean I went out and bought some Bacardi because of that? No. But just the fact that it's so memorable and it just sticks out so well and it's not obnoxious. Because it makes sense. You're making an order at a bar. So, for my number 16, Bacardi from The Spy Who Loved Me. We'll admit that didn't make my list, but I don't fault you for that in any way. Um, I've purchased plenty of Bacardi, not because it was in a Bond flick, but uh, just because it's usually 
uh, again, it's kind of, uh, in my mind, it's kind of right there in the middle with, uh, you know, kind of like like I said about Smirnoff, it's a good value for the price. It's a decent rum for a decent price. You're not paying too much for something that's garbage. You're not paying nothing for something that's really garbage. And you're not overpaying for something that might be a little better. But, you know, most of the time, 99% of the time, if I'm drinking rum, it's mixed with Coke or maybe Dr. Pepper. So I don't need fancy rum. I just need something. I just need rum. But I also don't want rum that's going to give me a headache, you know, two sips in. So I'm not getting the plastic bottle bottom shelf stuff either. Yeah, and I I actually also, if I am going to get rum, that is the rum I tend to get. And in fact, um, along with the white rum, which I, which I get from that, I also found that I prefer... Bacardi Oakart to Captain Morgan for spiced rum. And costs a little less, but I, I actually like the flavor better, either straight or mixed. But as you said, it's it's not a super expensive rum. It's not a premium it's not the premium, but it just mixes well. And for the spiced, it also happens to work straight. Um, so yeah, I understand. Cool. I'm not a huge fan of the spiced, but uh, Bacardi does have the their their white is good, and um, also Bacardi 151. If you really want to get messed up quick, <laughs> you go for the 151. Yeah, I, I for me 151 is specifically to float to set drinks on fire. Yes, flaming duck but, peppers. Oh yeah. That now is remember, be very careful when you do that at home, boys and girls. <laughs> but anyway. And if you do set yourself on fire, please do not mention that you heard about this beverage on our show. <laughs> That's a product placement exactly. tie-in we do not want. <laughs> but moving on to my number 15, this is one where it's from a movie that was very, very obnoxious about the product placements, though it, it was also in a, in a couple other Bond movies. But most people really pointed out in Moonraker. However... It doesn't bother me as much, specifically because it also has a really horrible, horrible pun. And I think Eric can probably guess, maybe. Mm, I, I have an inkling, but I want to hear the uh, horrible, horrible pun anyway, so go ahead. The horrible pun is the product's name, 7-Up. <laughs> if you're going to associate 007 with soda at all, of course it's going to be seven up. And at that point, especially in Moonraker, where you also have references to the magnificent seven, it's like, okay, I'm in on the joke. I get it. This is funny. Ha. <laughs> and so, yeah, j just for the, for the humorous value of it, I had to go with seven up from Moonraker as my number 15. And then also as a little bit of trivia, um, people f may remember commercials from the early 80s. The main um, spokesman for 7-Up was Jeffrey Holder, whom we all know as Baron Samdi from Live and Let Die. <laughs> I loved the 7-Up commercials. The ones that, I mean, this is an example of a funny commercial that has the name of the product right in the tagline so you can't forget it. And that was the Make 7, Up Yours commercials. <laughs> <laughs> It was so bad. It was so cheap. It was such an it's such a cheap ploy to you know to do. But at the same time, I laughed every damn time that commercial came on. I loved the Make Seven Up Yours uh, ads, especially the T-shirts, the Make Seven on the one side, and then just Up Yours on the back. <laughs> oh man, I was like, could I get away with wearing one of those to school? I would so love to do that. I never tried, but. Uh, I don't. I don't have Seven Up on my list. I will admit. However, I do not uh, fault you for that one. It's it's not something that I would associate with Bond, other than the fact that the number seven exists in it. Um, but it is my favorite of the lemon lime beverages of the brand name lemon lime beverages. It's uh, just a tiny bit better than Sprite and worlds better than that Sierra Mist garbage. So I'm okay with it. Seven Up, good pull. All right. So what do you have at number 15, sir? At number 15, this is where uh, the judgment questioning is going to go into full overdrive. Since this is a brand that has already been mentioned, not on this list and not by me, 
Um, and my, my number 15, and I, I kind of explained, and then you, you've already had some counters to this, so I will have to try some other brands to see if uh, if I find something that uh, that mixes better at a cheaper oh price. Oh, dear. The same price. I know what you're picking now. <laughs> um, but I, I had to go with the Smirnoff vodka. And not American because- vodka! And that's be- it's because, honestly, it's because before I ever saw it in a Bond movie, it had been basically my go-to vodka. So it was more of a, oh, hey, look, he drinks the same thing I drink, as opposed to, oh, hey, look, I could drink the same thing he drinks if I go out to the store and buy it. It was more of a, hey, I already buy that. So for me, it was more of a, hey, cool, Bond likes the same stuff I like already, you know. So that's You're just like James Bond. Exactly. I'm like, oh, look at me. I'm awesome. Um, that's, that's really what it came down to for me. And... Uh, it's just one of those things you don't often see. That's one thing I noticed that uh, you don't often see the vodka brands as often in the Bond movies. He's always ordering vodka martinis, but typically you don't see much of the brand, or if you do, it's it's very fleeting. With the Smirnoff, you definitely did see it, but it wasn't completely in your face, um, especially in the in the earlier ones. Um, you know. World is not enough. Well, okay, but th- I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more of the uh, the Doctor No uh, Smirnoff. <laughs> Let's go with that. Let's go with that. Um, I'm going specific. Yes, that's it. Specifically, Smirnoff vodka in Doctor No is on my list at number fifteen. <laughs> American vodka. I will try those other brands you mentioned to see if uh, see if you know for the same price or cheaper, I can get something actually imported that uh, that does the job. But for me, it's it's always been a good go-to for a you know decent price. I always find it on sale. I don't think I've ever paid more than ten dollars for a fifth of Smirnoff because somebody somewhere has it on sale. If it's not on sale at one store. Well, yeah, on because it's store. it's basically a step up from Fleischmann's. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I dig it, and I, I don't get in on all the, you know. Yeah, there's a bunch of flavors available and stuff now. I don't I don't, I don't get down on all that. Um, with the one exception, I did get some vanilla vodka once because I was trying to recreate a drink that I got at a club that no longer exists called a Fruit Loop. That in you know, the, you can get Fruit Loop flavored vodka now. Yeah, it's it's not the same thing. Oh, this drink was so good. It was um, it was it was vodka, uh, rum, vanilla schnapps, and pineapple juice, and a splash of grenadine, and my goodness, it was tasty. But I had so much trouble finding vanilla schnapps. And so I attempted to uh, you know, use vanilla-flavored vodka instead, and it didn't go well. So if, if you can find... Do you still have vanilla vodka left? No, no. This was, this was a long time ago. This was <laughs> We're talking 10 or more years ago at this point. <laughs> This Do you still have vanilla vodka left? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did manage to. Uh, I think I took it to a party at some point and pawned it off on somebody else. <laughs> of course, this was back when you know vanilla was pretty much one of the only flavors. You know, you didn't have fifty different flavors of vodka available. You pretty much just had vodka, and then they had like the vanilla vodka was just like the the newest thing. Yeah, because vanilla is one of those easy flavors that goes with most anything. So it's kind of one of the ones you see pop up first. Of course, now everything's honey and cinnamon. That's like the big thing. Everything, every dang brand of whiskey has to have a honey version and a cinnamon version. I'm like, really, guys? Just give me some whiskey. The honey's actually not bad. No, some of them aren't. Uh, I actually like the Jack Daniels honey version. I, I, I really like the Jack honey, yeah. Yeah, that's not that's not too bad. Um, uh, thankfully, I don't think any of the Scotch brands that, uh, that I've seen have tried any such gimmicks, and I'm happy about that. Um, you know. Crown Royal did do their maple version, which makes sense, you know, for a Canadian whiskey. It's not, it's not good. It's too syrupy sweet. I mean, it really tastes like somebody just took some maple syrup and poured some whiskey in it. And I'm like, this, I wouldn't do that for a drink. So I don't know why they decided to do that and sell me a whole bottle of it. That I still have more than half a bottle left. <laughs> Haven't found anybody to pawn that off on yet. <laughs> so what do you have at 14, sir? At number 14, this one is, I'm not sure if this was an official product placement. I don't know if this was paid for or not. Um, I would be willing to guess probably not because the the branding is not significantly visible. And it's also a brand that's not even available in the United States. So the chances that this were, was an official product placement are probably fairly small. Yet, it was such a fun scene 
And it gave you the impression that a thing that you wouldn't normally think is sturdy and well-built and good enough for Bond really was. And that was the Citron C2V from uh, For Your Eyes Only. I had a small bet with myself that this would end up on your list. <laughs> well, you have one, sir, unless you were betting against it. Um, yes, uh, yes, I love this little Citron. But yeah, most people probably had no clue what car that was unless they, they really looked for it. Um, but yeah, you have this car that you would not associate with Bond because it wasn't his car to begin with. But he puts it through its paces and it comes out uh, it comes out clean on the other side. So I'm like, you know what? They just showed that this car can take a beating, you know, a Bond size beating, and keep on going. So I'm, I'm okay with this. If this were available, I might consider a Citron in you know in my life sometime. Um, of course, it's not an, a, an available brand in the United States. You have to have one you know, brought over from England and. Oh, I'm sure you can find an import dealer. Just drive to California. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're they're always available. Like I was very surprised. I decided one day just to take a look. Um, I forget what what I was looking for specifically, but I was like, I had it in my mind to. I wonder if anybody's selling one of these, um, you know, random British brand cars. And I actually found several, even in my local area, available on like Craigslist and you know Auto Trader and whatnot. You wanted ridiculous amounts of money for them, you know, for the <laughs> the actual value of the vehicle. Were you buying it anywhere other than the United States? Would be insane. But yeah, so yep, that's my number fourteen, Citron. All right, I can't. I don't have it on my list, but I do not fault you for having it on yours. I understand. Now, my number fourteen is also a source of amusement, though apparently not as much for you. Um, <laughs> I. Long before I even thought about doing this show, I have always found one particular scene, one of the single funniest scenes in all of James Bond. And I don't know why. It is funnier than it has any right to be. But it is just, it just, I crack up whenever I see it. And even before we came up with a different joke, I cracked up every time I saw this. And, of course, we have sometimes James Bond needs a little help, or at least people want to keep an eye on him. So sometimes Felix Leiter would be checking up on Mr. Bond to make sure he's okay while he's being held in a dungeon. And, of course, that's tiring work. So you have to take a break every so often. And apparently, Felix Leiter loves chickens. (laughs) He loves Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> so on more than one occasion, <laughs> Felix Leiter and his CAA partner can be seen parked outside Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is, of course, Goldfinger oh, licking good. <laughs> yes, I, I knew, like the moment I said it, I was like, I was like, when was he in America? Oh, that's right. Live and let die. All right. Wait a minute. He's been there before. This doesn't fit at all. Um, so that gold finger licking good chicken <laughs> from Kentucky uh, Fried Chicken. Just, I, I understand that it wasn't Bond who was, you know, really doing the, the, the finger licking, but at the same time, it just... It's such an unbond brand. It just uh, well, the fact that Bond is even in Kentucky for anything other than the Kentucky Derby seems weird. <laughs> I, well, that is but, true. But just and especially the idea that Felix is sitting on his ass on the job and suddenly he gets go. Hey, we got to get going, and totally misses out on his surveillance duty. Why? Because of Kentucky Fried <laughs> Chicken. That's what happens when you love the chicken too much. It can it can have negative impact on your life. <laughs> it, but it is Goldfinger licking good. All right, I'm not. I'm not going to fault your reasoning. Um, like I said, it just it's one of those ones that popped out of me. Like one of the first things when I when we first you know, kind of like for you when we first discussed doing this, this was one of the ones that first popped out of my mind. But for me, it was not in a good way. It popped out of my mind because I was like, oh man, yeah, I remember that time they were just standing in front of KFC. What the heck? So. You know, two different sides of the coin. And again, I don't have anything against the brand. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. I love the chicken myself. So, I it's just, this scene has been funny for me since the first time I saw Goldfinger as a kid. <laughs> I just thought it was hilarious, and it can so. And now it's even funnier because of 
the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, my number 14, the Goldfinger looking good, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And by the way, here's some trivia for you, and many, many people who watch a lot of movies may know this already. One of the ways that you can always pick out a movie that was actually shot in Canada as opposed to the United States, one of the ways that classically you could, but this only works for movies made before the financial crisis of 2007, is if you look at the skylines, you can see Canadian bank names on the towers, like Scotiabank, Bank of Montreal, uh, Toronto Dominion. Of course, now since 2007, Canadian banks, which were remarkably solvent during all that, now appear in America. So that's not necessarily the case anymore. Uh But one thing that is reliable is if you see a Kentucky Fried Chicken, but it says PFK instead of KFC, that's because you're seeing the French side of the sign, which is Poulet Frites Kentucky. (laughs) So that is the... That that's the clue that your Kentucky Fried Chicken is in Canada. So just a little bit of trivia for you. This now, of course, Canadian the Kentucky Fried, fried chicken, chicken that we saw, that was Goldfinger looking good, was from Kentucky, but still. Kentucky Fried Chicken in Kentucky? That's just weird. <laughs> but moving on to my number 13, this, I admit, is specifically for... The nostalgia of it, and just it makes me laugh the way the reference is used. And this is product placement where you have the name of the product and the full spec of the product read out as part of dialogue. But it is done in a way that makes absolute perfect sense in the context of the scene that you see it in. However, from basically... Almost the moment the movie came out on, and especially now, those specs are hilarious. (laughs) I think I know where you're going with this, and that's uh, pretty cool if it is. And that would be the IBM computers mentioned in GoldenEye. Yes! With with the hilarious specs that are now so completely out of date and practically were the moment that the movie came out with their 14-4 modems. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes you know how much I love when this happens especially in the middle of the list when it's not just at the top of the list when we have an identical placement it's, so what's it's just, your number 13 <laughs> well it's of course those IBM computers and their 14.4 modems <laughs> yes it was one of those ones where yes you did have that blatant product placement you, you, she walks into a, an IBM store and specifically requests this particular computer with these particular specs which yes I'm like I'm pretty sure that I've had watches that had more powerful specs than this you know in the last 10 years um, it's crazy but it was still and it, but it did fit, and it worked for the scene because she's going. She just needed access to a computer, and she didn't have one. So, what she do? She goes and pretends that she's interested in buying a bunch of them to get access to one for for a short time to do what she needs to do. And it, it just it worked in the context. It wasn't blaring as it, in in the moment. It wasn't blaring. It's a little bit blaring going back and looking at it, especially because you know you hear those specs and you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> How did anybody get any computing done on that? Yeah, it's it's just one of those. It's hilarious. It's like the same feeling I get when I watch Johnny Mnemonic, which was made in the same year. <laughs> it's just hilarious. That's so a fun movie. People, I, I know a lot of people who knock that movie, and it's not a great movie, but I liked it and I enjoyed it. It's fun. If you knew anything about computers or the cyber scene at all. It was outdated the moment it came. Come on. Part of the movie involves a fax machine. I mean, it's just hilarious. Yeah, I use a fax machine on a daily basis at work, so... <laughs> that says something yeah, about the well, uh, <laughs> In the mid-1990s called, they would like their technology back. Yeah. I really wish they would take That's it, a, too. I'm like, seriously, we can't have this email to us now. <laughs> I have an analog pager, so I understand. <laughs> Got so... Paper? So that was our, our, our number 13. What do you have at number 12, sir? Number 12, another item from that same film. Uh, one of my favorite films, of course, so you, you had to know that there was going to be a couple of places on this list for it. Um, number 12 is one of the vehicles from that film, but not one that Bond drove. One that another favorite character of mine drove. 
as a matter of fact. And that would be I can't the, imagine who the gorgeous, gorgeous Ferrari that the gorgeous, gorgeous Famke Jensen was driving in the chase scene when, or the racing. The, I wouldn't say chase; I'd say more of a race scene between Bond and Xenia on the top. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful car and a fun scene because you have, you know, Bond racing around against some random strange woman who just happened to pull up next to him, all the while with the person who's supposed to be uh, evaluating him <laughs> in the seat next to him. Uh, great fun scene, kind of sets the tone for the film that we're going to have this kind of fun aspect to it. Uh, so I really dug it. I dug the scene, and it's unmistakably a Ferrari. It's not something that you can question later, being like, hey, what, what car was she driving? That was a Ferrari. Everybody knew it. Um, so that's my number 12, the Ferrari and Goldeneye. I'll say it's not on my list. I understand why it's there, especially on your list, because of who <laughs> was driving it. I'll admit, for me, product placement on Ferrari begins and ends with Miami Vice. I mean, just... <laughs> it That... They're, they're intertwined. They are they are one in the same. You have the Ferrari Ferrari Testarossa from Miami Vice, and that's that's Ferrari. Didn't so, uh, but did I understand? Pi drive a Ferrari too. I don't know. I've never really watched the show, but he had a nice little fancy sports car, wasn't it? A Ferrari. I don't remember. I never really like I said. I never really watched the show, but for some reason, when I think Ferrari, like. You, if it wasn't a Ferrari, then good job, Ferrari, for making your product uh, seem like it was placed even in shows it wasn't. It's like the Corvette <laughs> Stingray was Starsky and Hutch. So, remember that. But And the Chevy Impala was every car in Live and Let Die except for a couple, couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> that, by the way, did not make my list, but I thought about it. I just did a quick Google, and in fact, Magnum PI did drive a Ferrari 308 GTS. So, Well, there you go. There you have it. Ferrari. Now, now my number 12 and number 11 are a box set. Okay. My number 12 is something that prominent, and I'm sure you're going to know what these are the moment I start describing. Um, <clears throat> the prominence of the description originates in the books as far as the very specificity, but it does make its way into the movies, and specifically, it is most articulately and very much in front of everyone, so there's no question that you're not, you're not missing anything described, because the line is quoted directly from a book mm -hmm. in Quantum of Solace, and that is Gordon's, which is, of course, the liquor brand that is recommended for making a Vesper, specifically for the vodka and the gin. And it's a brand which I think without this reference might be on a lower shelf than it tends to be placed on. Because I, I honestly think that the association with the James Bond martini over the course of the past 60 years has given this some cachet. And so... It doesn't rest on as low of a shelf, and it's especially in the United States, where people think, what? What's this? Because you'll have, of course, most people who've never read it, but it has just enough cachet that the brand of Gordon's mm -hmm. is, I mean, it's not top shelf by any means, but it it's on a higher shelf than it would be. Yes. And I think a lot of that does come with the association with James Bond. And... You have, you have it not just in the books, but it is articulated in the films. So, in this case, for my number 12, from Quantum of Solace, just because that's where you have the best description of the drink that is not mumbled, not in the middle of anything else. There's no background noise at all. <laughs> Very much described in your face. Gordon's. Which brings us to number 11, which is why I questioned your judgment before. <laughs> Kina Lele. Or, as it has been known since 1985, Lele Blanc which I don't think would even be stocked in a lot of liquor stores, if not for the association with the Vesper. Yes, and in a lot of liquor stores, it's not. I, I actually had to go to a couple before I found it, but when I did find it, the guy knew exactly what I was looking for immediately. I mean, I literally walked in, I'm like, I, I'm... Needing, I'm needing to find a particular product. I'm trying to make some Vespers. And he's like, okay, so are you looking for the uh, Lule Blanc? I'm like, 
yes, I am. And he's like, it's over here with the vermouth. Yeah, and it because that that is of course the vermouth substitute, and it's very specifically said not to use vermouth, even though in other books, because James Bond is of course not specific to the Vesper in the books, he does use vermouth. Mm-hmm. And there is vermouth actually used as product placement in some movies. But the fact that it is in the Vesper is why I think as many places that have Lille Blanc now have it. And by the way, even though it's technically more of an incredibly sweet white wine, do not drink it by itself, um, <laughs> it is put in the vermouth section if you're trying to look for it. Um, I figured that out the hard way. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, I had to go asking for it, but as soon as I said I was going to make Vespers, and of course this was after uh, Casino Royale and uh, Quantum of Solace had come out in the theaters, so it was more prevalent. If I had gone trying to look for it pre-Casino Royale movie, it might have been even harder to find. So this is one of those instances where I think the product placement has very much affected the availability of the product and the knowledge of the product because honestly if it weren't for Vespers I wouldn't give a crap <laughs> and I don't think a lot of people would but there it is because otherwise you know you're making a martini you're going to use a remote so because of the Vesper and the associates with James Bond the Lille Blanc or formerly Kina Lille as the remote substitute makes my number 11 oh. I don't. Uh, I don't fault your judgment there. Like I said, I, I very specifically, originally I had these two together on my list as well. You know, boom, boom, right together because of you know they're they're together. That's the whole point. Um, I did move the Kina Lele down because of the fact that it was a in the, by the time we got to the movies. If we were talking about the book placements as well, I would definitely keep them together. But because we're talking about the movies primarily. And the fact that he's actually referencing a product that doesn't technically exist, uh, at least not under that name. So it makes that extra step you have to take to find out what to replace it with. I think that takes a little bit of the effectiveness, if there was any, of the product placement away. So that's why it moved down on my list. But I don't, I, I don't fault the idea because, like I said, if we're going based on the books, which were written when both were freely available, then I would definitely have them together. All right. So what do you have at number 11, sir? My number 11 is uh, one that you had previously mentioned and a, a favorite product of mine uh, growing up. My uh, <laughs> grandfather had tons <laughs> of these. Um, in fact, I, just in uh, a previous episode of Socially Awkward Studios, I uh, discussed my, my collection of these. Um, and that, of course, is Playboy. It's 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 a perfect bond tie, I think, because it's if you're going to look at a nudie magazine and still be somewhat classy about it, Playboy's your go-to. There's there's not really any other choices. There's other choices for almost nude that are classy. You can look at uh, you know there's there's various different magazines that are available that have uh, sexy pictures but not nude. And there's tons of magazines that have you know, full-on nudity and other stuff, but you'll but never feel classy. But just doesn't say have, have the same <laughs> yeah. cliche, yeah. does it? You cannot sit in an airport reading a, a Hustler and not get extremely dirty looks. You can get away with it with a Playboy. And you're still going to get some dirty looks because there are, you know, there's, there's prudes out there who can be like, oh my gosh, breasts, oh, I'm freaking out now. Um but especially back in this time frame, it was the, the classiest option available, and uh, I, I don't have a problem with it being associated with Bond whatsoever, especially considering you know, the, the history of Fleming's work and Playboy. So I thought that was a great placement. I thoroughly enjoyed that, and uh, you know, so that's why it made it all the way up to my number 11. Yeah, and I can't fault you for your judgment at all. Even though I had it lower, I completely understand. Playboy just gets it up higher for you. <laughs> oh, man, especially the ones I had. Oh, man, I had a huge collection that were my grandfather's. My grandmother had actually purchased the su- subscription for him and kept it going um, for basically the last... I think he had them... I think he was receiving the subscription for the last nine or ten years of his life. So uh, there were 
uh, and he never threw them away. So there were boxes and boxes of these things at my grandmother's house. And uh, she wasn't, you know, a prude about sex or anything like that. Uh, there was actually a, uh, a drawing of her that was a new drawing of her hanging in her own bedroom. So it's not like she was, uh, you know, worried about me seeing breasts. That wasn't a problem. Um, made a lot of trades for some of those old magazines for other things to expand my horizons as well. <laughs> All right. So that brings us into the top ten. It does. What do you have at number ten, sir? Number ten begins a, a little... I wouldn't necessarily call it a package deal, but I'm noticing a trend as I'm just kind of glancing at my list. After um, Playboy, we get to the package deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, it's a... Uh, you'll see where the, where the theme goes here. Uh, number ten is the product placement that everyone loves to hate but I actually thought was very well done. We discussed it right at the beginning of the show, and that is the Heineken beer. Um, and even though the uh, most recent placement in Skyfall was not the first time Heineken had been placed in a Bond film, it is the most notable, so I will go ahead and choose that one if we're going for specifics. Uh, as, as we discussed, it was not blatant and in-your-face. The only blatant in-your-face Heineken ad featuring Bond was a separate commercial that was just a Heineken commercial, and I was totally fine with that. Um, in the movie, you just see Bond drinking a beer in a situation where a guy might drink a beer. And you had to know that it was Heineken from all the hype leading up to the movie to even know that it was a Heineken. It wasn't that blatant and in your face. Uh, and I thought it was very effective because I can honestly say that I, that I may have actually purchased Heineken since that movie came out, that I may not have purchased. I, I, I don't know if it was conscious. I didn't go to the store and say, I'm going to buy Heineken because Bond drank it. It was more of just, I probably would have just glanced over it on the shelf if it wasn't for the fact that I the, I made that recognition. I was like, oh, Heineken. And, oh, yeah, you know what? I, I, I could drink some Heineken. It's not bad. I'll have some of that. It's on sale. I'll grab some of that. So they may have made at least one sale based on that placement. So, <laughs> but more for the fact that it's, like I said, so many people gave it so much crap, and I think there's so much worse placements out there um, that actually brought it higher on my list. The uh, the drama associated with it actually helped hype up the amount of uh, of placement. If you had just been in the movie and just been the commercial and nobody had said a word about it, it would have been you know whatever. But because it was such a big deal, they got even more free press out of it. So I think that's effective, and uh, effective gets some points on my list. So. Number 10, I like the Heine. All right. I admit that the only Heine on my list came from Playboy, so <laughs> but I completely understand. I can't fault you for your placement. My number 10 is something that you mentioned already, except I'm being a little more broad in scope with it, and that is from the movie Eric Loves to Hate, Never Say Never Again, Atari in general just because you can't have a video arcade without Atari. It is the most sensible world-building product placement you could have for an arcade. And there you go, because you did make it, they didn't pick up games except for Domination, and that's understandable, because that's a plot point. But right. you didn't just see Centipede, you also saw Frogger and some other games there. Robotron and or something it's just, going on? The whole Atari product placement to make the arcade into a real arcade really it, it worked it, and it was it's one of those things where it was necessary but there have been a lot of other movies that have gone out of their way to not do it so for my number 10 atari i can definitely uh, see that like i said i definitely had that on my list specifically for centipede because that's the one that stood out for me like i was like hey i played that game i believe right next to it was the robotron or something 2084 or 2048 or whatever that game was i never liked that game so didn't really stand out but boom right between them here's you know bond and the girl having a conversation and Im directly in between them in the middle of the frame is centipede and that just yeah so I, I can definitely see that going higher on the list. Uh, it was my 16, but I can definitely see it at 10. Not a problem. Now, for number nine, something that's a little less conventional. However, it is it can be argued that it is now one of the two most recognized visualizations of this particular kind of product in the world. And 
it is specifically traced back to its placement in this particular film. And that is from Live and Let Die, The Tarot of the Witches. Now, some a lot of artistic purists for um, people who are into tarot decks consider the art some of the ugliest art ever for a tarot deck. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on that, but it is nonetheless one of the most recognized tarot decks in the world. That and the writer tarot deck. And the unfortunate thing is you can actually buy a branded James Bond 007 version of this deck with the 007s on the back. And in fact, this is one of the only times when inside of the James Bond movie, the 007 logo was used as a part of product placement. Because if you look at the cards in the movie, they do have 007 written in the background. The only other place you really see that is in the Thunderbolt Parade. Um, so th this is a very unique product placement. But if you buy the replica set that's available for purchase, it's not a full deck. All it is is the Major Arcana. So the things like the Death Card, the Priestess, the Lovers, and by the way, the replica deck comes with seven extra Lovers cards. <laughs> ah! But it does not include like the whole suit of cups, the whole suit of swords, even though some of those cards were utilized in the film, the replica deck doesn't have those. So it's not a complete deck. It's only a, it's only a 22 card deck as opposed to a 78, but it's still very effective, very recognizable. If you see a picture of any one of those cards that was used in live and let die out in the world, you'll recognize the deck immediately for what it is. So highly effective and very well-known product placement. And also it has the unique bit of having the 007 logo on it in a film. So Terror of the Witches from Live and Let Die at number nine. All right. I will admit that that did not even cross my mind when we were doing this list, but uh, I, I completely understand. And I do not uh, disagree with your reasoning in any way. It might be interesting to uh, maybe see if we can't come across a, one of those decks at some point. So what do you? They're available on Amazon.com. All you have to do is go to HerMajesty'sPod.com, <laughs> click on the Amazon link, and look up the 007 Tarot deck. Buy it as normal, and we'll get a little piece of it that'll help us keep our show free on the air for you. This will be one of uh, one of the things I actually put in the episode description. I'll probably put the actual Amazon link through our affiliate link uh, <laughs> directly in the post to make it easy. So if you're listening to us on any other format besides our website at HerMajesty'sPod.com, just pop over to HerMajesty'sPod.com, click on this episode, and the link to the Tarot of the Witches will be right there in the description. There you go. So what do you have at number nine, sir? My number nine continues the theme I began with Heineken, and this is one that you've already mentioned. This is part of the package deal for the Vespers. And this is where I placed the Gordon's Gin. Um, much higher on the list because it's not only, uh, as you said, probably would not have the relevance that it has in the, in the world today, especially in the United States, without the Bond Association. Also still available <laughs> under the name as used in the movies and in the books, of course. So uh, while not the best product out there, it's the association has definitely got it that longevity that it may not have had otherwise. And uh, as I said, I bought a bottle of Gordon's specifically to make Vespers. So one, 100% confirmed sale uh, based solely on its association with James Bond. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. So that's my number nine, the Gordon's gin. All right. And what about for your number eight, sir? Number eight is the is not the final of this theme in my list altogether, but the final in this little trifecta. And this is one, again, not the best product of this type, even though it has the reputation of being one of the best products of this type, um, even though anyone who's actually tried it knows that, hey, you know what, there's actually better for cheaper. But it really it makes me think Bond. Like, if I had to say... You know, what brand of champagne is Bond going to drink? The first one that pops up is Dom Perignon. Tadden would probably be the second. Really? 
but the first one that would pop into my head would be the uh, the Dom. And uh, so that's why it made it to number eight on my list. And I decided to only include one champagne brand. I, I thought about including more because he does uh, specifically drink some other brands. Um, you know, Tattinger is mentioned by name uh, several times, I believe. We're, I, we're going to be discussing this later, and I'm going to completely disagree with you. <laughs> like I said, I know that the product itself is not the best, but for some, when I think Bond and Champagne, the first brand name that pops into my mind is the Dom. And so that's why I made it onto to my number eight. Okay. I completely question your judgment. We'll be <laughs> discussing that shortly. All right. Now, for my number eight... I was trying not to go with any physical locations because I think, you know, the tourist bureau doesn't count. However, that one location that I think was used to really, really awesome effect in a movie that you can really go to, even though of all the places like this in this particular city, it's one of the ones I'm least likely to go to, but it was just used so effectively. And that would be the Circus Circus Casino. <laughs> as used in Diamonds Are Forever. Because there was a prominent scene mm -hmm. that was set specifically in Circus Circus, made to be, it could be nowhere else but Circus Circus. Yeah. And they spent a good 10 minutes of the movie on it. Yeah. So it wasn't just one you could walk into, because when they walk into like the Tropicana, it could have been anywhere. Yeah. But oh, Circus Circus, there is only one Circus Circus. Yeah. And they make a very big show of it. And it was very effectively done. It And yes, it was cheesy, but only because the entire movie was cheesy. <laughs> so it fit it, into yeah. the film without being obnoxious in a way that the movie wasn't. So, so I had to go with Circus Circus from Diamonds Are Forever. All right. I, I didn't think of that, um, mostly because, like you said, it's more of a location. But I do completely understand, and I don't fault the, don't, don't disagree at all. Uh, Circus Circus I've actually been to several times. It's not one that I stop by. Like, if I go to Vegas now, I don't bother with Circus Circus. But I went to Vegas several times with my parents when I was a kid. And my favorite stop of the trip was Circus Circus because it had the most that I could do. Uh, you know, so, you know, with the arcade and everything else, all the Midway games, stuff like that. It's It was just, I knew when we were heading for, you know, when it was Circus Circus Day, that I was going to have a damn good time. So... And that was pre-Bond era for me, so there you go. All right. So now moving on to my number 007. Crack in the That would be something 007. that Eric has already mentioned. All right. And this is one of those, again, where there was lots of negative hype. And, okay, it may not have been used to the best effect the first time around, but they kept going with it, and it was used to better effect each time. And that would be BMW from basically the entire Brosnan era of the <laughs> James Bond universe. So just especially because of the negative hype, because people say, what? He's driving a Beamer? What? Yeah. And the, it what like I said, it wasn't used to the best effect. I agree with you in the very first time it was used in Goldeneye. However, he kept going with it and it, the cars were great and it was a, I think a very good association. It made sense. I mean, these are performance vehicles, and BMW did take a nice jolt for it, so it was effective, and they proved that James Bond could drive a German car. So BMW, number 007. All right. I uh, will not fault your judgment or even question your judgment. Uh, as I said, that was one that uh, – might appear on my best of list as well as my worst of list, only because my worst of was that very specific example. Um, but my number 007, also a car, also identified by three letters, not BMW, though. Uh, for me, this one, even though <laughs> you can't even get these cars now, it still stands out to me as one of the best worst scenes and the one of the worst best scenes in any Bond flick. And, uh, of course, I'm talking about the AMC cars, uh, specifically the AMC used to jump <laughs> over, to do the corkscrew jump. <laughs> With that horrible sound effect. Yeah. That's the, oh, it's such a great, great scene. Great jump. Awful sound effect the, ruins the jump. Yeah, with the exception of J.W. Peppa 
<laughs> and that. Why did you have to put that C with the sound in there? But the car is awesome. The jump is awesome. It's still one of the best, uh, you know, actually uh, filmed stunt scenes for a car that I think I've ever seen. You know, nowadays you do something like that and just be CGI immediately. So because of that, I will go ahead and give it a, a nice spot of honor. My 007 on the list is that AMC. I believe it was a Hornet, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I thought that was a fun fun scene, as long as you plug your ears and don't listen to the slide whistle or whatever <laughs> was going on there. All right. I, I don't have it on my list. I understand why it's on yours, though. I'm, I'm not going to question your judgment. What do you have at number six, sir? At number six is one that you've previously mentioned on this list, but a long, long time ago. And I just I don't understand why you had it so low, Mom. I just don't understand. But uh, this is the I will I will say this is the final uh, alcoholic beverage on my list. No more alcoholic beverages on my list. There were quite a few spots devoted. I'm just looking here. We've got uh, the Kina Lale, We've got the vodka. We've got the beer, the gin, the champagne, and now another beer, Red Stripe beer, makes it to my number six spot. Um, Did we mention that James Bond is a functional alcoholic? <laughs> I think we have in, in previous episodes, yes. So I think it warrants uh, this many spots. I think the alcoholic beverages warrant this many spots on our lists. Um, but yeah, I, I really liked... It's just one of those things you associate it with, with Bond, and you associate it with Jamaica, and it was just, you know, being one of the one of the earlier product placements, it's, it works. And you still, like, I can still, you know... And Red Stripe isn't even a bad beer. It's not great, but it's not bad. Um, and every now and then, I'll pick up some Red Stripe, you know, get some of those little short stubby bottles and, you know, pretend I'm living on the island. Put on some Bob Marley <laughs> or <laughs> maybe some UB40 if you, if you want to go part way. <laughs> man say. Um, no, that's, for me, again, it comes down to it, it did jump up some points just for being one of the first. I mean, you know, obviously it's right there in Dr. No, so it's one of the first film uh, product placements that we get to see. And, uh, you know, and I didn't think it was badly done. You know, you have the actual bottle sitting there. You have the, you know, you know then the boxes, you know, played into the scene without being obnoxious, obnoxious about it. I think it worked. And so it, it jumped all the way up to number six for me. All right. Now, for me, at number six, we have something it placed specifically in. There's two films that I'm thinking specifically, even though it was actually in multiple films. In fact, there's there's three really prominent uses of it. And what, the first one is one that a lot of people miss, including Eric, by the way. <laughs> um in the spirit of in fairness, the, if the one if it's the one I think you're talking about, I did not go back and add it to my list, even though I, I thought about it. But I was like, you know what? I missed it the first time. I'm I'm leaving it out. Bear in mind, by the way, I'm not saying that we know each other's this. We don't. It's just that when we were discussing the source material that we were going to grab from, Eric Eric said, "Okay, this is the source material list I came up. with. Did I miss anything?" And I said, "Well, here's a product that I think you missed." And I didn't know if whether he'd had his list done or not, but so yeah, this is a product that Eric li Eric missed when he was on his source material list. But to be fair, a lot of other people do too. In the movie Goldfinger, you see, of course, that Lincoln get crushed inside of the junkyard crushing machine, and so in order to kind of make up for that. The producers made a deal with the Ford Motor Company that they would also promote another vehicle of theirs that was just coming out. And so for the very first time on film ever, you got to see a Ford Mustang. Not just any Ford Mustang, but a Ford Mustang convertible. If you're wondering, that's what the girl is driving when they're chasing down Goldfinger in Europe. And so and then you would later on see another Ford Mustang in On Her Majesty's Secret Service when Tracy calls it her Big M. <laughs> and then, of course, we have the very wonderful parking lot chase scene in Las Vegas. So, very, 
yeah, it's it's American domestic, but if you're going to pick an American domestic that James Bond is going to drive, Ford Mustang, especially of the 1960s yes. era, is a fine choice. Now, granted, everybody associates the Mustang with 1968 Steve McQueen Bullet. Can't fault you for that. One of the best car chases ever <laughs> filmed. But James Bond also made good use out of it, and he made use out of it first before anyone else in Hollywood. So... Ford Mustang from Goldfinger on Her Majesty's Secret Service, Diamonds Are Forever, and so on, is my number six. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, like I said, when I was compiling the list, I pulled information directly from the IMDb pages of each individual movie. I just compiled a quick list, uh, not my ranked list, just a quick list of any product placement information I could find because I didn't, didn't find anywhere that had uh, <clears throat> a definitive list. And so... Um, and then when I shared that list to see if I had missed anything, evidently this was a glaring example of one that was not only missed by myself, but missed by uh, basically everybody who did any of these lists <laughs> anywhere, wiki, wiki. at any time. <laughs> so uh, it's not all my fault. But yeah, once, uh, you know, at that point I had already started completing my own personal list and I decided not to go back and change that. Uh, although I will say, uh, taking that into consideration, it definitely would have ended up on my list. I don't know that it would have cracked the top seven or even the top ten, but it definitely would have made the top 20. All right. Well, now moving on to the top five. The, these five, for me, one of which I know is not on your list. I question your judgment, sir. <laughs> we're not there yet, but we're getting there. I just know it's not on your list because you've already said it's not based on other hints you've dropped. All right. But I, I consider these five Bond essentials. And the first one, number five, most notably from The Spy Who Loved Me, but also from For Your Eyes Only, when it was not treated as well at all. <laughs> In fact, it was blown up immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I know what That you're would be about. The Lotus, yes. specifically The Lotus Esprit, but we'll just go with Lotus. One of the two essential Bond vehicles. When people think of Bond car, this is one of the two they think of. That Lotus Esprit that drives underwater and that, of course, the Russians saw the plans of two years ago. So it, it's just very classic, very, very iconic James Bond vehicle. Even though, um, if you read Roger Moore's memoir, Bond on Bond, Roger Moore was not particularly taken with the Lotus. In fact, he declined an offer to um, shill for them, basically, because he just didn't like the car. But if you're looking at iconic Bond car and something that you can safely say got a boost from being associated with Bond, it'd be I'd say Lotus is a good shot at number five. Um, yeah, I, I I do not have that on my list. I, I will admit. What I did? I'm I, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I I thought about it. I really did. But like you you said, uh, you think of the top two Bond cars, and I think of a different two Bond cars automatically pop to mind. And it's probably it has to do with uh, my introduction to the Bond universe. Um, we, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit more here in a moment. But I I liked Lotus, but I didn't like it enough and uh, honestly like if I redid this list again right now it's very possible that it would make the list but then again it's also possible that I'd look at it you know I'd already be adding the Mustang so maybe I'd think you know what I've already got too many cars on this list so I might leave it off <laughs> maybe I'd swap it out for the AMC I don't know but it's one of those ones that I did think about it as I was making the list but it didn't jump to the forefront of my mind so it didn't end up making the list. But I, I don't fault your reasoning, and uh, I definitely agree with the fact that it is an iconic Bond vehicle. Uh, just for me, it doesn't pop into the top two of iconic Bond vehicles, but we'll, we'll discuss that. So it, I think for the top five, I think I, I think because we have... I'm, sh I, I'm betting our top two are going to be the same. I, I believe that our top two will be the same. Maybe not in the same order. Maybe. Probably in the same order, but maybe not. Um, and, and I also believe that at least two... I think that uh, my top five... Here's my guess, my bet right now, is that my top five 
will contain four of your top four. I already know that one of my top five uh, is not going to be in your top four because it's been previously mentioned. Um, I'm going to guess that in my top five, three of them will be in your list. I think the top two will be the same, may or may not be in the same order. I already know that two of them that are in my list are not in yours because you just said the Lotus isn't in the list and... Based on other comments you made, I know one of mine is not there. Uh oh. Okay. But I figure for for these, because of how interesting it's going to get, I think we should just do one at a time with these. Okay. So what do you have for number five? My number five. Ooh, see, this is tough because my number five and number four are kind of a, a package deal. You know what? Okay. Go go ahead and do them as a package deal. We'll do five and four as a, a in our normal thing, and then we'll go one on one, one from there. I, I only did these ones as a package deal because they are very very similar. Um, but the two major brands that we see, yes, there was another brand that was used that was previously discussed uh, and is not on our best of list. But that would be the watches of Bond. Uh, I have the Omega and the Rolex with the Rolex barely inching out the Omega. And honestly, these could have taken, these could have flip flopped easily. But I think the Rolex wins out just barely. Uh, the watches are an iconic part of the Bond universe. You know Bond's going to have a watch. It's not as blatant as in James Bond Jr., where you know not only is he going to have a new watch every single episode, but every single thing that watch can do is going to be an integral plot point. (laughs) Uh, But you know that he's going to have a watch, and it's probably going to do some stuff. And it's going to come into play at some point. And the most notable brands that were specifically noted were the Omega and the Rolex. So my number four, I'm my number five and number four, respectively, are Omega watches and Rolex watches. I'm going to both agree and disagree with you. Because <laughs> my number four is the Omega watch, or as Daniel Craig so charmingly calls it, Omega. Um, I did not include Rolex at all. What? Because everybody uses a Rolex. It's 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 so it's to the point where it is so it's it's practically generic. I think if you're rich, you got a Rolex. Well, that's it. Yeah. It's just but I think that's because of Bond. No, it's I don't think it's because of Bond at all because it's ubiquitous across everything. It has nothing to do with Bond. It's Rolex is Rolex is Rolex is Rolex. It's just it's the generic rich playboy watch whereas omega who do you associate with that other than james bond gq um no honestly with the omegas the only time i'd ever really seen the brand has been in uh advertisements uh in like maxim or gq or things like that and so really the only time i've ever seen them so Um, so with these but that's just it with the associate with a person it's only bond because I agree with you. Otherwise, I've only ever seen it on either billboards or on a few sports stadiums. They will sponsor the clock. But Rolex is everywhere. Every rich, every rich asshole has a Rolex. Whereas only James Bond is associated with Omega. I, so for me, Ro- Rolex just became generic. I, I can totally understand that reasoning. However, for me, when the word Rolex pops out, the first thing I think of is the Rolex knockoffs, knockoffs, just because for some reason that just sticks in my brain. But the second thing I think of <laughs> is James Bond. <laughs> I don't think of any of these other associations or even just the generic rich person thing. My first association is with Bond as far as a person. So that's why it's still one out for me because I, at least I still have that association. It, it still seems like a Bondish thing. It's got that Bondy necessity that I like. So. I- I agree it's Bondish, but for me, the only one that's actually just plain old Bond and nobody else is Omega. But I understand your reasoning. We'll agree to disagree. That's fine. I, I won't I, question okay your judgment. I will give so, you a funny look from afar. Now, <laughs> speaking of funny looks, my number three is one that you did not include and that I was I was kind of disappointed at the one you did include for the exact same reason the one you included aside from being an inferior product is also just generic 
it is the generic rich bitch champagne. So Dom is not on my list. Bollinger is at number three. Because Bollinger is, again, the champagne that I can't think of any other major association in terms of immediately with anything else but James Bond. I mean, because if you look at the generic, just ridiculously rich champagne, it's Dom Perignon. And then if you then get into more champagne snobbery, the first two things that people tend to think of just in terms of you know, mass market are Dom Perignon, Veuve Clicquot, and then you start moving on to, you know, the Mouton, blah, blah, blah. But Bollinger is specifically the Bond champagne. And so that's why I have it at number three as part of the Bond Essential Collection. Oh. And see, I think if I were to rank the associations for me for Bond and champagne, Dom tops the list, as I already said. My next thought would actually be Tattinger, and then you would be. This would actually be third on my list of, of just association. I've never had either one uh, to you know to to tell you whether or not it tastes good. But Bollinger would actually be third on my list of associations with Bond if I were to list them list them off as my uh, champagne. I associate with Bond. You'd have Dom, then Tattinger, then Bollinger. All right, but to each their own. Indeed. I'm not going to uh, question your judgment. I understand your reasoning, and I'm okay with it. So what do you have at number three, sir? At number three, this is the one where, uh, as you said, I mean, this was on your list. It, it, one example of this was on my bad list. But for the most part, by and large, I felt that this was a very, very solid partnership between Bond and this company. And I thought that a lot of great uh, product placement came out of this relationship, and so I have to go with those magical three letters of German engineering, BMW, with the one exception of the Z3 in GoldenEye, because I just thought that was a wasted opportunity. But every other BMW we've seen in the Bond franchise has been fantastic. Uh, the Z4 was great. The uh, the 750i was fantastic. I love the scene with a you know remote control. Everything else, I- I've loved this association, and that's why when you say the top two Bond cars, for me, BMW is number two on that list. Um, number one, I'm hoping that we're both in agreement on, but uh, well, we'll get there. <laughs> but uh, for me, uh, top two Bond cars, number two is is BMW. And so for my top three Bond placements, BMW makes that number three spot. So with that in mind, I think I think our top two brands are going to be the same. I believe so, too. I'm wondering if we have them in the same order or not. I, I bet that we do, I think, if I, if I have any clue how you think at all. But I think we've proven time and time again that I don't. So <laughs> let, let me ask you this. The product that is most closely related to your number three, do you have it at number two or number one? I would say number one. Then I think our lists are going to be the same. All right. <laughs> so... At number two, would yours just happen to be something that is most notably noted by another famous three letters carried in one hand? Yes. (laughs) Could it possibly be that ubiquitous handgun, the Walther PPK, Yes, it is. Actually, specifically, I went with Walther handguns in general because he did also uh, use the P9. But, um, yeah, you think of Bond, you think of the Walther. Now, whether or not that was a paid sponsorship or whether or not it was an actual product placement or just, you know. Well, it it came from the books originally. Yeah. So, So. A lot of people don't think of weapons when they're thinking of product placement. And even, like I said, I, I looked through that. That was one glaring thing I noticed from the lists that I compiled off of IMDb. None of them mentioned the Walther. And I'm like, how do you, I mean, it's named. It's not just a, oh, if you happen to know guns, you'll notice that it's a Walther. It, they, they name it <laughs> very specifically, and they very, they're very clear about what it is. So where you know maybe not everyone will agree that it's a good idea to have a product placement for something like that in a movie at the same time 
if you're watching a movie that involves guns and shooting, how can you really be? How can you really complain about them? You know, putting a specific brand of gun in the movie. You know, if you if you don't like that sort of thing, you're probably not watching too many Bond movies. If you're really anti-gun, you know. <laughs> and if it act, it also makes sense for its use. It was, it actually. Um, I'm not going to slaughter the German, but the PPK actually designates the fact that it was originally made for German National Police. And it was a very, very popular law enforcement weapon for a very long time. So also when you have Tsiolkovsky saying that um, he only knows a few people who use a Walther PPK, that's kind of absurd. But um, <laughs> And if you research the characteristics of it, it's a very light, easy-to-shoot weapon, even for people who are not that comfortable around guns. So it's, now of course Bond is, but I'm ju it's just, I think a lot of its popularity is drawn directly from its association with 007. I don't think there's any question of it. Oh. I mean, it started as a popular weapon in the past, but the fact that it is still a popular weapon, even though normal, it is no average, longer the state of the art, yeah. is, yeah. The fact that a normal average person who walks into a gun store might ask for a Walther is a testament to the placement in Bond. I don't think you have that. I don't think you have the average American uh, handgun purchaser walking into a gun store and asking for a Walther without that Bond association. You know, they're going to go in there and they're going to ask for the Glock, the Beretta, you know, something else. The Walther is going to be that Bond fan who's going to go in and ask for that. Um, of course, yeah. then you're also going to have the gun salesman who then says, oh, you're just doing this because of the movie. Let me sell you something else. And you're like, no. And then they'll, they'll argue I, I with you. But, you know, I know what I want. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. We're not saying it's the best handgun available. There are others. Uh, you know, Six Hour puts out a fantastic uh, handgun. If you've got the cash to spend and you want a good weapon, then, you know, go with a SIG. If you want something sturdy and reliable that's going to last forever, you go with a Glock. They're ugly as garbage, but. It's going to last forever, so you know you got that going for you. If you want pretty and stylized, then you go for the Beretta. It's going to fall apart on you, but it's which pretty. is exactly why Bond carries a Walther PPK, <laughs> by the way, because his Beretta failed on him. Yeah, um, I love the look of Berettas, especially the nine, the, the Beretta nine millimeter, the original one. Uh, beautiful, beautiful handgun. Um, but yeah, um, not quality, not very, very good quality in comparison to to other brands available, including the Walther. So. Uh, yeah, it was a good fit for the character, especially since you have, you know, you make a point that it's a good weapon for someone who's not that familiar with handguns or not familiar with shooting, yet it's still a good choice for Bond because they specifically set it up with him not wanting to, tra to change to the Walther right away. He wanted to keep his Beretta even though it had failed on him and almost got him killed. He still wanted to keep it. Um, he even tried a little sleight of hand that M you know, quickly shot down. So you had that scene uh -huh. where you have the placement, you've got it there, but you still have the character of Bond kind of pointing out, like, no, I like my gun. Um, but ultimately, you know, he wants to keep his double O designation, so he uh, does what he is told and starts to carry the Walther. All right. So I think now there's no question what's at number one. Eric, would you like to do the honors? Uh, sure. Uh, at number one, I have, of course, the car, the Bond car. This is the car that will always be number one, hopefully on anybody's list <laughs> of Bond cars, but definitely in product placement in general, the Aston Martin. Uh, Specifically the DB5. Yes, absolutely, the, the DB5. But there have been other great Astons in the Bond universe as well, so the entire brand has been very well represented. Um, but yes, of course, the DB5, the original you know, Goldfinger DB5, brought back beautifully in Skyfall. Um, just absolutely amazing. Just a beautiful car. It's, it's a good car. It's something that you associate with wealth and privilege, but most importantly... You associate it with Bond. Uh, and the fact before. that it's associated with Bond, I think, is why even non-car people know what Aston Martin is. Yeah. Because otherwise, I, th I think that's one of those niche brands that wouldn't necessarily go into, say, the average redneck consciousness. Exactly. But because of the association with James Bond, we all know it. And we all know what a DB5 is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely agree the... 
the the association with Aston and Bond is so strong that you know even I mean that was one of the biggest controversies with Bond going to BMW for the Brosnan era was the fact that he he's not going to drive an Aston yeah, how dare you it's like well they didn't want to pay us for him to drive an Aston and BMW did so guess what he's going to drive a BMW for a while and I thought they did a very good job of it but I'm glad that Aston wanted to get back in and uh, and jump back on that bandwagon and it's interesting too because the iconic car in the books is a Bentley yeah his his car his personal vehicle is a Bentley in the books so yeah yeah so a very 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 effective product placement as far as the Aston Martin the Walther just is there is there it, they just scream the James Bond lifestyle and they're so associated with him and people, so many people want to be him that I think if you're going to do product placement with anything, as long as you very much fit into that niche lifestyle that James Bond is supposed to represent, you can't, this is one of the places you want to be is associated with Bond. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you can't go wrong. I mean, it's to the point where even like we discussed Volkswagen, how would you want your vehicle to be associated with getting essentially demolished because they're in Bond's way? But yet, there's no way that many Volkswagens ended up in that same scene without there being a product placement deal in place. You know, it would have been just random vehicles or junk vehicles or just random new vehicles that you know, weren't really recognizable. They'd been generic or something like that. But no, these were... VW Bugs, very obviously. And even though, for me, it left a, a sour taste in my mouth for VW, obviously they thought it was worthwhile. Though I will say that VW actually had one of the most effective billboards I've ever seen. Even though, again, it did not persuade me to buy a VW. Wouldn't have even thought about it. It's just, again, it's like the Bud Light commercials. I, I thought it was funny, so it sticks out in my head. It, didn't, it won't persuade me to buy anything, but I thought it was funny. When the Beetle first was reintroduced around the millennium, it, a billboard that I saw driving by comes with nifty new features like heat. That was just great. Because, <laughs> of course, the original VW Bug was heated only by the heat of the engine, and that was it. It didn't have a heater. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, but other than that... Um, I do want to give a shout out for a product placement for a pl for a product that was totally fake, but which I thought was hilarious. Um, one of the only highlights I thought of out of the man with the golden gun, and that was the foo yuck wine. I just thought that was just very clever on somebody's part. Is foo yuck, and of course it was the fine 1974. The movie was made in 1974, so. <laughs> But so, so there's also room for the fake product, and I'm I'm good with that particular one. But any other thoughts on product placement in 007 before we go? Um, no, I think we really covered the majority of uh, you know what I wanted to talk about. You know, basically, it's one of those things that you know product placement in general can be annoying when done incorrectly. It can be completely ineffective if not done correctly to the point where you don't even realize that it's happening but when done right it can both uh, not distract from the story I wouldn't necessarily say enhance the story but it can definitely not distract from the story and in many cases actually be effective uh, even more effective possibly than traditional advertising because we associate it especially with a character like Bond that we love so dearly and is so big and so, uh, you know, spread out. You know, there's so many Bond movies and you associate a product with Bond, you're associating, a, the character, you're associating that product with all of Bond, even if you only used it in one movie. So the idea of product placement in Bond, I think, is a great marketing tool for, uh, for companies as long as they keep it to things that make sense in the Bond universe, whether it be something Bond would actually, in fact, use, makes sense for the character, or like in the, the uh, example of Bacardi, if it makes sense in the way it's used in the film. Yeah, and I, I do think that it's also effective for world building, because if you're 
going through what's supposed to be a modern city and all you see are advertisements for things that don't exist, then when you have everything not existing and it's supposed to be this day and age, it kind of takes me out of it because there's, okay, these products aren't real. This, this is all, this is all stage. Whereas the Cokes and the Pepsis and so on, it's like, okay, this is the modern world. So I, I think there's something for it for world building, but overall, yeah. Um, but if there's anything that you guys would like to talk to us about regarding the product placement, whether you agree with us, disagree with us, think we missed something, or just want to discuss this in general, you can always reach us. You can visit our website at hermajestiespod.com. Leave a comment under this episode's listing, and we will be we will see it there. You can also email me directly. I am at Ziggy at CinemaOnTheRocks.com. You can find me on Twitter at CinemaOTR. I am also available via email at Eric at HerMajesty'sPod.com. I'm also on the Twitters. You can follow me at Eric J. Dewey. Um, and, uh, of course, don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at HerMajesty'sPod. And, of course, give us a like over on our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash HerMajesty'sPod. If you're sensing a theme here, that's right. There is a theme. If you just remember, yes, and <laughs> and keeping on with our theme of product placement, of course. If you would like to place products in your own home, we would love to have a little taste of it, so we can keep making this free for you. So by all means, go to our page, hermastyspod.com, click on the Amazon link, do your normal shopping, and we will get a small commission without any extra charge to you. I promise we won't advertise this much in future episodes. It's just, come on, this is an advertising episode. What are we supposed to do, right? We pretty much have to in this episode. I mean, it would be, it, it's expected. Uh, this episode has been brought to you by RC Cola. That's been my beverage of choice for the uh, for the morning. And my beverage of choice has been Cherry Coke Zero, and we'd like to give a special shout-out to Steve O'Mooney from the Fluoride Radio Network, who hates product placement with a passion. <laughs> but in our next episode, we will be doing far less product placement. Instead, we will actually be talking about the career of Sean Connery after his final turn as 007, and we'll be talking about some films where he's still kind of Bond-like. And we will also be having a look at the brand new Pierce Brosnan film, The November Man, where he plays a James Bond-like character as well. Yep. So be looking forward to that next time. Post-Bond, bond necessity or something. I don't yes. know. We'll come up with a cool name for it. But, uh, yeah, just a, a, a look at uh, some of the Bonds, specifically Connery and a little bit of Brosnan, post their Bond movies. Uh, but see how it ties in. See how that has kind of flavored their career. Post the, post the Bond films. Neat. But that's all for this episode of Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. I'm Ziggy Berkeley. And I'm Eric Dewey. And you have been listening to Her Majesty's Secret Podcast only on the Four Eyed Radio Network. <laughs>